It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat's here. Mary Jo Foley's here. Is Microsoft really in the bidding for Discord? We'll talk about the $10 billion price tag. Intel's new future. Is it a good strategy? And then Paul explains why you might want to use the dev build of Microsoft Edge. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 717, recorded Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. Grovian Culture. Windows Weekly is brought to you by ESET. ESET protects businesses worldwide with Internet security products and services backed by world-class research and tech support. Get your free ESET business trial and an interactive demo at business.eset.com slash twit and save 20% on ESET Protect Bundles for a limited time. And by Thinkst Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the How Did You Hear About Us box. And by Melissa. Like expired milk, 30% of your customers' data goes bad every year and that's money down the drain visit melissa's developer portal for free access to data quality apis demos and code samples freshen up your sour data today with 1000 records clean free at melissa.com slash twit it's time for windows weekly the show where we cover the latest news from microsoft and there's big news this week Paul Thorat's here from Thorat.com, LeanPub.com, the place where you can get his field guide to Windows 10. And he joins us every week, of course, because it really is his show. I'm just here to read the ads. Show sure, Leo. It's all of our shows. <laughs> I'm just the, the glue that holds the ads. No, you're the glue that holds the ads together. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're the stuff that keeps all the ads from happening all at it's once. It's more like that paste you make where you, when you're a kid and you eat most of it. <laughs> mm, <laughs> it doesn't really. Mm, tastes good. Mm -hmm. And that's Mary Jo Foley. She's the other person that keeps the ads from happening all at once. Mary Jo Foley is at allaboutmicrosoft.com, her ZDNet blog, now celebrating her second vaccine. Yes. Why not get three and just really be extra? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. So, you know what? I'm just worried that's what's going to happen because of all these, you know, variants, yeah, especially the say, new variants. Come, come, <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Come get your booster. It'll be like the flu. I yeah. know. I know. That's it'll a, be like it'll every be like week you're flu. going in for another shot. Oh, right? God, I <laughs> hope not. Oh, my God. That would be not good. Did I you have any that. reaction at all to the second shot? Um, I ached a little bit, but I've heard so many horror stories about people like headaches, fever, chills. And I'm like, no, I didn't yeah. have any of that. <laughs> oh, that's relief. Yeah. I, I felt good. I felt I, pretty good. And today I feel great. So I'm like, good. okay. <laughs> Mary Jo, you look great. And you know something? Hey, you seem you. healthy. Uh, there, apparently, <laughs> the maroon shirt him. memo went out, and so that might be that might be why. Is that right? That might be why. Is that worn by people who got two shots? <laughs> right. Do you have a secret handshake if you yeah, get the you second should. shot? Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's called an actual handshake. You can tell when they're not doing the elbow thing. But do bring your CDC card with you to yes, Krispy Kreme, definitely, because right. you can get, get a free, free donut. donut every day for the rest of the year. I wish yeah, I, I liked it. I actually think that, <laughs> right. So that's the smartest thing I've ever heard in my life, not going to Krispy Kreme, but them doing that. Oh, because it's I think they they reach I a know. demographic that, let's face it, is probably uh, full of people who might not be getting a vaccine if, otherwise. If the vaccine maybe, doesn't get you, the donuts will. Yeah. No, if you if you were like on the fence about it, and you're like, wait, I can right. get a free, free donut, donut every day. <laughs> you know, I think this is a good use of uh, corporate influence. They're Smart. doing their civic duty. Krispy Kreme was invented in New York, wasn't it, Mary Jo? I think so, wasn't it? I feel like it was, and that for a long I feel time. Like it's like from, it was. I thought or it was from the South. Am right? I confusing it with the cronut? <laughs> oh, Jeez. that's definitely a New York thing. <laughs> that's right? definitely from New York, the cronut. I never, still to this day, have not had a cronut. Me neither. Really? I know. Uh, no, because I, I can't eat donuts and that kind of stuff. It makes me not feel good. I love oh, them, but I ex ex can't eat them. You're not alone. That's universal. I just feel yeah. terrible when Krispy I eat Krispy Kremes are I great going like, oh. down. Terrible when they get there. That's why they call them sink. Yeah, guys, there's a reason yeah. Dunkin' was called Dunkin'. Well, actually, they were called Dunkin' Donuts. Dun Dunkin' Donuts exist because of coffee, not because of donuts, right? I mean, that's the the thing people yeah. go back for every yeah. day. 
Yeah. Krispy Kreme sauce stick was donuts, and it's yeah, it's it's a little much. So Paul is you- correct. Krispy Kreme was invented in Salem, North Carolina. Of course, it was home of the. Donut. I told you guys. I once said this years ago because they expanded across the country, and they got to New England finally. New England is Dunkin' Donuts country, and I said yeah. the most excellent thing I've ever said in my life, which was, "Mark my words, New England will be Krispy Kreme's Vietnam." <laughs> and <laughs> that's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> sure enough, they did not succeed in New England. Uh, yeah. Update it. It's now Afghanistan, by the way, if you want to quagmire. Yeah. Yeah. The modern Older, quagmire. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. We're not here to talk about donuts as, as we, thrilling as Darn, that may be. Come on. <laughs> I got to ask you about Although the, I did go to a donut store today. Did you? I went to Dunkin' Donuts Duncan. just to get coffee. But you always go to Dunkin'. Mm-hmm. Do you get a donut? Never, right? No. Rarely. Actually, although, actually, it's funny you say that. Today, every once in a while I come home and <laughs> I'm like, Stephanie, I don't know why. They just gave me like two donuts. And so I'm just leave on the table. And today the guy said, it's free donut Wednesday. <laughs> and I was like, nice. okay. <laughs> They're trying to compete so with I, Krispy Kreme. I, I was like, I don't know. All right. So I guess I'll <laughs> nice. like two donuts. I don't know. Free donut Wednesday. But no, I don't usually buy donuts. No. We have a phrase at Twit called drop donuts mm-hmm. because we had an employee who uh, it was one of our editors. This was years ago who abruptly decided I can't take it anymore. I'm out of here. And uh, <laughs> so he bought, uh, he brought a dozen donuts and said, I quit yeah. and left. Oh, wow. <laughs> he actually brought a gift. <laughs> he brought a gift and said, I'm gone. Hoping to, oh. to soften the he blow. He did later ask for his job back, but it was too late. The, the donuts didn't do it. Yeah. However, wow. Lisa has now <laughs> said that's the term is dropping donuts. And uh, from now on, <laughs> when somebody brings a dozen donuts, we, uh, right. we we query them closely. So Microsoft CEO, according to Bloomberg, hunts anew for Creator Hub after TikTok bid fails. Uh, <laughs> it was also rumored that Microsoft was in the running for, dis- for uh, Pinterest, right? Right now, uh, the rumor that's why, is so that's that's the thing though, right? So everyone's freaking out because why does Microsoft need another messaging service or another mm. another way for people to chat or whatever? And I don't think that has anything to do with that per se. I think it yeah, has right. more to do with just the community aspect of it, right? Well, I'll give yeah. you the quote mm-hmm. from Satya Nadella. I said this in an interview last month, but I think now we're kind of now it's, it's yeah. timely. Creation, creation, creation. He said it three times. Remember? Well, this is the developer, developer, developer thing. It's a callback to Steve Ballmer. Uh, The next 10 years is going to be as much about creation as it is about consumption and about the community around it. So it's not creating alone. If the last 10 years has been about consumption, we're shopping Mm -hmm. more, we're browsing more, we're binge watching more. There is creation behind every one of those. But I see that phenomenon becoming much more democratized. So I think it's a hint. Mm -hmm. That he's thinking, how does Microsoft position itself o- over the next decade? Uh, and he right. apparently wants some creation tools. Hence, TikTok, hence Pinterest. <laughs> is Disc- I guess Discord's for creator. It's Paul, you, you do you use Discord for gaming? I don't. Um, the thing that's interesting, so Discord has a, a big gaming community. Microsoft obviously doesn't have a gaming community chat service per se. I mean, they, obviously, they have messages in Xbox, but they used to have Mixer. Um, and now they're kind of agnostic to whatever the, this streaming type services are that are out there. This is kind of a different thing, though. I, I don't I feel like Discord is. Is all over the place, like they have different little you know communities that serve different types of audiences. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not just gaming. It's messaging. Yeah, it was originally gaming, I guess. But uh, I don't know that I've ever used it. I don't. It's uh, it, <laughs> this is probably unique to me, but it's. To me, it's like the new IRC. So every uh, open source project, for instance, every um, language, every game, every bit of software has a Discord channel now where you can go and there are people living in there um, just as they used to do in IRC. I mean, I guess they still do, but they, but that really was the place they used to do it, where they'd always have IRC open and a bunch of channels open. Now they always have Discord open and a bunch of channels open, not on mobile okay. necessarily, on the desktop. And that's how they're interacting. So it, it might go nicely with GitHub. Uh, it might go yep. nicely with Teams. It seems to kind of overlap. Well, by the way, teams. GitHub is a great example of community. Uh, Minecraft, arguably, is a mm-hmm. community. Right. I mean, they, right. they've been kind of on this path for a little while. You they have. Argue. They have. I, LinkedIn, I obviously. 
Yeah. I, I just, when I heard about it, I just thought, okay, it complements their gaming strategy and don't even put any of the other messaging things in the equation. It just makes sense for the gaming thing. Yeah. We don't, we don't need any more indications that Microsoft is serious about gaming, but they are serious <laughs> about gaming apparently because right. they're making all right. kinds of acquisitions. Well, that's creation too. I mean, it's consumption, Yeah. but one yeah. of the things that makes at least some of the newer games more than that, Minecraft is a good example, is there is a creative mm -hmm. community around it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even Fortnite arguably has a little, a little <laughs> kind bit, of a, yeah. a little yeah. creative uh, I, thing I in wonder, there. I wonder, you, know, you know, we went through this single, single person gaming thing and then yeah. online, massively multiplayer online mm -hmm. became a big thing. World of Warcraft is, the, you know, the poster child for that. Certainly yeah. people have been modding ever since, you know, Team Fortress. Yeah. But you know, I mean, since Doom, arguably, right? I yeah. mean, Doom, they kind of opened that thing up and. Yeah, modders love it. But I wonder if yeah. that is maybe the next next thing. I, you know, my next game is is called Valheim. It's a building, survive. it's called a survival game like Ark kind of, uh, yeah. where there's building, but there's survival. It's, it's kind of, it's a massively it multiplayer. A, it is, okay. Yeah. Actually, it's not massively. I take it back. Up to 10 players, you can have, you run your own server if you want. Right. So you can have it's 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 buddy gaming. In fact, you really kind of apparently need to. I, I mean, when, there's all room for all kinds of games, but you know, for the types of games I play, like once you play multiplayer, once you've had that experience, the like single player campaign type stuff seems lonely, a little interesting. It's quiet, yeah, it's just, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in Valheim, so, anyway, it doesn't you need, prepare you, need you for that. You need a team. Same experience. thing with World of Warcraft. You can't really do well in World of Warcraft on, unless you've got a a, right. a team. So yeah. when you guys talk to other people in games, like what do you use to talk to them right now? Um, there's in game well, I mean, chat for a lot of games. Yeah, there's, I don't chat yeah. with anyone when I play games, but it's because he's old. I, yeah. I used to. I, I went through a long period of time where you literally had a chat window open with type, and because I was a very fast yeah. typist, this actually worked well for me. This is twenty years ago mm -hmm. or something. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, but when you switch to console gaming, I mean, they actually do have this little chat keyboard things that they used yeah. to but um no i mean right now it's probably mostly um just microphone and you, have, you know you're talking right. to your so teammates you don't use any any service per se to talk to anybody no but that no. doesn't mean discord isn't heavily used by others i mean it's very right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know when people first started chatting verbally during playing a games they were using mm -hmm. third-party services yeah. uh like discord sure. Because it was I used to do it over the phone. I'd be yeah, playing um, yeah. Quake or uh, Duke Nukem 3D, right. and I'd have like the phone cricked into the corner of my neck exactly. and <laughs> chatting with the guy I was playing with. You know, Discord does yeah. uh, text, of course, but and that's its primary mode. But there is a, a v audio mode. Uh, there's yeah. even a video mode in Discord. Um, somebody in the chat room, uh, Evil John, says, "I'm probably on 20 or so Discords. Lots of tabletop RPG communities live with okay. their tabletop. So mm -hmm. I think it's just become." For non-business messaging, group messaging, yeah. it's become a very popular choice. It seems to me yeah. it's a much better acquisition for Microsoft than TikTok. It's more along yes. the lines of Pinterest. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. partially because I feel like TikTok is a flash in the pan. Like I, I TikTok is the type of thing that hits so so uh, so such a huge success so quick. Everyone just kind of copies it. And so all of the existing services have added like a TikTok type, a TikTok type <laughs> mode. Um, and I don't, I, I mean, we'll see. It's obviously a, it's a year later, it's still around or whatever. But um, right. yeah, Discord seems more like a classic kind of chat mm -hmm. uh, uh, experience. So know, what, what do we know yeah. uh, about Microsoft's interest? Is it is it just rumored? Is it Uh, so, so by the at way, at least three independent sources, yeah, multiple reports, exactly. It, yep. right? Okay. <laughs> Within, um, within Microsoft. Well, no, I mean, no, this one, is like being like Bloomberg, no, New York Times. No, I right, Dean Takahashi, yeah. I think, He's well connected. about it. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, so I, I think it's true, but I forget which of the reports it was said, but the talks are not currently active. Oh, um, yeah. And there's a chance that Discord wants to IPO instead of get bought. They're asking for $10 right. billion, which for Microsoft would be chump change. That is nothing for them, right? Like, if you look at right. the history of their acquisitions, I'm like, yeah, that, that, I mean, it's not nothing, but it's definitely within the realm. I would guess. What was the, 
What was the Bethesda price? You remember? Was it? Uh, wasn't that yeah, a lot more? Yeah, seven point five. Oh, was 7. it? Seven point five oh. billion. Oh, it yep. wasn't. Yeah. Lot. So I mean, it seems like that should be worth more than Discord. I mean, right. they have yeah. so much IP, they have so much back catalog. Yeah. Uh, they're going to contribute in a serious way to the bottom line going forward with yeah. exclusives. Um, I'm surprised that's not worth yeah. more than something like Discord. Microsoft mm-hmm. for uh, GitHub paid seven and a half billion as well. Yeah. So, so ten is a lot. Tens a lot. Uh, so it would be their second highest. Later, so, you know. It would be their second highest okay. acquisition ever. Guys, so LinkedIn Microsoft had a pretty good year last year. You know, in they the did. sense that, like, <laughs> some people are like, right. uh, you know, I didn't really spend a lot of money last year. Maybe I should start right. splurging on things. I mean, they yeah. they have the money. You know? so I they guess they wanted to buy TikTok for twenty plus right. billion, right? So right. they've got the right. money. I <laughs> guess know? that the ten billion came from Discord. That Discord right. was in effect saying, well, if we IPO, we're worth $10 billion. Yeah. They were worth $7 billion right. in their last valuation. So, That's right. Yeah. That's and right. I think what they're saying in effect is if you want to buy us, <laughs> yeah, there's the premium. It starts at $10 billion. Right. Uh, yeah, we're right. going to get that anyway. And by the way, Microsoft's not the only one at looking at this company, right? right? Epic Games, I know, is one. And I, I think, was it Amazon? Amazon. Was the other? Yeah. yeah. Amazon is a supplement to Twitch, which mm-hmm. makes sense. Part of, yeah. yeah, right. Part of what makes Discord work is that they provide the servers so you set up a server but you're not running it yourself it's run on the mm-hmm. discord platform mm-hmm. so yeah. it would it, it would it, which probably is on azure let's face it so it would kind of make sense or maybe it's on yeah. aws uh, let me just see where Discord. Or maybe even their own servers right at this point could be um so oh, no i saw it's on google they're on google it's on google <laughs> interesting yeah well, yeah interesting well someone's gotta be <laughs> huh yeah. So, you know, of course, they'd like to have them on Azure. That's not the main reason they would go for them. I mean, when they talk about buying communities, what they mean is we're trying to get a group of users we don't have right now. Right. And we're yeah. bringing them into the Microsoft well, fold. That, yeah. And we so other stuff, right. <laughs> I'm curious about the non gaming communities that are in Discord, because in some ways, yeah. I feel like that might be a bigger deal to Microsoft. Um, they, they obviously have a gaming community. It's 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 pretty sizable mm-hmm. for what it is. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I want, last, like bringing Discord 2019, they that. said there's 250 million users. That was two years yeah. ago, almost. Mm-hmm. I saw a figure, I, it was, I, I'm not going to remember this correctly, but it was either 100 or 140 million monthly active users. And I think the user base they cited was 250-ish million, yeah. something like that. But I bet you the users on Discord are very active. It's kind of like WhatsApp, frankly. Yeah. How much was WhatsApp yeah. worth? 29 billion, something oh, like that, be, yeah. to Facebook. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. I think it's in that realm, to be honest. Mm. Hmm. It's wor- it's okay. worth a lot. That's yeah. great. I would say. Yeah. Uh, Discord sp- is supported on Xbox Live, by the way. I don't know if you ever right. use it, but yep. it is on Xbox Live. So. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I want to talk less to people when I'm online. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so that's I an speak. age I, an age thing. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Well, there's a lot of stupidity. You got you, the types of idiots who play Call of Duty. I know. Uh, like me, are uh, idiots. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stupidity. Yeah. But Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't, yeah. you know, I haven't written anything about it just because I feel like lately we've been hearing about Microsoft right. doing due diligence on things and talking to a lot yeah. of companies. But you don't know if it's ever going to happen, right? Like I agree. Else? And in fact, I was, I kind of, I made you <laughs> put this up at the top. No, it's good. We should talk about it because it, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, no, the the Nadella thing is interesting because that kind of came to light yeah. after the fact, right. and mm-hmm. um, right. it puts it does took put a new spin on it. Yeah. And I, I like I said, I, I feel like this is more than gaming. I really feel it, you yeah. might even view this as part of a consumer stab. You know, general consumer mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. push. You can also do video calls with it, so and and voice calls. So it's kind of an interesting. Yeah, you, you almost could say it's the consumer version of Teams, <laughs> we, we, which is Skype. We have that right? product. Uh, <laughs> it's called Skype. Yeah, um, I know. Uh, I saw people saying, you know, so what would the, what would this mean to Skype if they buy Discord? I'm like, yeah, oh. and that's this is no. that's actually a bigger problem than maybe it seems like because for the first yeah. time you get in, into a conversation about brands in which one has the better brand, you know, mm-hmm, uh, there's mm-hmm. been an assumption for a while that teams would take over for Skype, even on the consumer side. But right. in some ways but I feel like Skype is that. actually the yeah. better. No, I know, but I, people kind of yeah. assume this and yeah, yeah. You know, I feel yeah. like Skype is still a pretty good brand. I mean, 
Yeah. So I don't they know. They haven't totally killed it off brand wise, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just looking for their service. I'm not sure they're running on Google. They do use Electron for the desktop. I, think I saw app. that somewhere. I forget where I saw that. It sounds like they might have their own, because I'm seeing an article that says they have 11 uh, data centers. Oh. So, but this was, I don't know, this was a while ago. So I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you'd be crazy to have your own data center these days, right? I was just going to say, it seems like any major distributed cloud service would have to be on at least two of the top three. Right. Well, uh, look at LinkedIn, at guys. LinkedIn still runs its own servers. Um, <laughs> so, well, yeah. I mean, but how many? I mean, is LinkedIn yeah. relatively small, though, compared to like how many LinkedIn, how many users does it have? No, it has a lot, like hundreds of millions, you know. Does it? Okay. Yeah. I oh, think this, yeah. at least for voice, I think Discord runs its own data centers. Hmm. I don't know where I saw Google. I saw this it. Company, some, I it, read so many reports about this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, this is why we're doing due diligence before we buy yeah. it. You understand, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. When hmm. Google Cloud, somebody's in the chat room saying, well, when Google Cloud goes down, Discord goes down. So that might be the, hmm. the hint. <laughs> there you go. The hint. Right. Um. I think it's well uh, very yeah, widely I mean, used, even in Amazon in, and uh, Microsoft probably have more data centers worldwide than whatever that figure was right. for Discord. So, right, yeah, that's a clue too. Yeah, it gives me, you know, I imagine if you're running a Discord server and it's a big thing for your business or your community, that this gives you mm -hmm. some chills, just as when GitHub was sold, it gave open source developers yep. chills. But Microsoft's been a pretty good steward for Minecraft and GitHub. <laughs> Microsoft has been fantastic for both of those things. I I, uh -huh. I hope because yeah. I know there's still people gaming and open source, right? Uh, who still distrust Microsoft strongly for whatever reason. But I don't know how much more evidence we need. I mean, I I think they've done a great job with both of those things. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I apologize for hijacking your show, but I wanted no, to know. You know what? It fits in with the first set of things we're going to talk about, which are all the Leo, you know we make notes for a reason. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I actually appreciate it. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Right? <laughs> Sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy the ride, as they used to say in, when we used to fly. Next time, we're going to do it alphabetically. I don't know why I have to screw it up. Exactly. <laughs> Let's say hey, Apple. What did Apple do this week? Oh, A. A is for I don't uh, care. A is for Amazon. A is for Amazon. Let's take a little break, and then we'll come back, and uh, we will get to the corporate cogs turning. The wheels are turning in Redmond. What does that mean? Our show today is brought to you by ESET. We have been relying on ESET for years here at Twit to protect us from ransomware, malware, all the little beasties and goblins and ghoulies that exist out there in the real world. It's enterprise-grade security. It's easy to manage for a small business like ours. In fact, it's our MSP, our managed service provider, who, uh, who, who put ESET on our network to protect us all. Russell loves ESET for a couple of reasons. It's easy for him to manage. ESET has cloud management software. So Russell doesn't work full time for us. He's got other clients also on ESET. And what he can do is, is as he travels around, he can check in and see how the network's running, see if there's issues, uh, check, you know, if there's infections from the console, wherever he is. That's really, really nice for him. I think he also likes the fact, I know I do, that ESET is very lightweight. So lightweight we don't even notice it's running. It doesn't take up much memory or CPU. It gets the job done without interfering with your machine, which you cannot see for most uh, security software. Uh, big new developments recently. They just introduced their brand new endpoint security management platform. It's called ESET Protect. Uh, and one of the features that they, uh, you know, they, they're they touting, which is one of the features Russell really likes, is ESET Protect Cloud, which means you've got cloud-based management, perfect for a business of any size, whether you're a giant enterprise or a small business like ours. And there's no restrictions on seat size, so that's fantastic. Saves us a lot of money. ESET Protect also takes security to a whole new level with two bundled products. These new bundled features enhance protection against ransomware and zero-day threats. And they've added full-disk data encryption for Windows and Mac. 
We like that because we have a unified encryption strategy. You know, Mac has its own, Windows has its own. You have to have Windows Pro, et cetera. With ESET, every, full disk encryption available everywhere easily and can be managed from the cloud. Right now, you can save, by the way, 20% on these new bundles. So you're not only getting best-in-class cloud-managed protection against advanced attacks, you're getting a big, big discount. For small businesses or MSPs like Russell, I recommend ESET Protect Advanced. That's the bundle that has all the security you need, the cloud-based management console. You also get endpoint protection. You get cloud sandboxing. This is how they, uh, by the way, fight zero days. Because before any attachment comes in over the transom through our email, those are, of course, one of the number one vectors for malware. ESET, without, very transparently, very quickly, in, basically invisibly, <clears throat> takes that attachment, uploads it to the cloud, opens it in a sandbox, watches what it's doing so it can't do anything damaging, watches what it's doing, and if it if it checks out, then they let it come in and uh, and be downloaded. That is great, especially for zero days. I mentioned the full disk encryption. There's file server security. There's a cloud-based console. That's the ESET Protect Advanced. If you want on-prem, you can do that too. ESET Protect also offers uh, those options that I mentioned. Either way, you're getting a powerful, reliable cloud-based or on-prem security system based on 30 years of research and innovation. Um, by the way, I got, I got a free trial waiting for you and an interactive demo. If you go to business.eset.com slash twit, business.eset.com slash twit, E-S-E-T. They just uh, got the uh, the title of a strategic leader in the AV Comparis Comparatives Endpoint Pre Prevention and Response Comparative Report. They test the leading nine vendors, ESET, got the highest combined prevention and response score in the test. So uh, really good news for ESET. Good news for you if you're using it. You know you're getting the protection. It makes me happy. And if you're not using it, remember, you can get your free ESET business trial and an interactive demo at business.eset.com slash twit. 20% on uh, ESET Protect Bundles right now. 20% off with this limited time offer. Trust ESET to future-proof your business. We need it these days. Business.eset.com slash twit. Thank you, ESET, for protecting us. Thank you for sponsoring Windows Weekly. Thank you, all Windows Weekly listeners, for uh, supporting the show by going to that address. All right, what's going on uh, at Microsoft headquarters? The pandemic's That's over, Leo. Oh, we're yeah. all coming back. <laughs> <I> know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I'm noticing in the San Francisco, where, and here too, where the restrictions have been lifted, you still have to have a sm you know smaller number than usual, like twenty five percent employees. Most companies, ours included, are not saying come running back. What's Microsoft doing? So next week on the twenty ninth, they're moving from what they call their stage three to stage four. Stage three was work from home, strongly encouraged. Stage four, soft opening of the Redmond campus. How soft is soft? So, yeah, it, it's up to teams and team leaders about who can come back. And maybe you'll just start with people coming in one or two days a week. Um, it's not like everybody must come back to campus. That's not what it is. It's more if you guys need to come here, you want to come here, you want to check out how things are, you can start coming in and, of course, observing all the protocols and precautions doing so. Maybe Wearing you have a masks, plant you haven't watered in 13 months months or months, et cetera. whatever it is. Come on back. <laughs> I haven't been to my post office box in over a year. <laughs> I, don't, right. I don't want to go back. I don't know what it's going to be. I know. I think you that's know, you interesting. Hear, you hear both things, though. You hear some people saying, yeah, oh, my God, exactly. I can't wait to go back into yep, the office. Exactly. It's, it's so stressful being at home. And right? then other people saying, I like working I at home. I never want to go back. Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting yeah. to see that. I know. It is. I just want to travel so, yeah. again because I've been working at home for whatever twenty. Yeah, we all years. we work at home. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I think it's it's an interesting point. I at, at first when I wrote about this this week, I saw I had lots of people pushing back on me, of course. Like I made the policy yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How dare you say go back, Mary Jo? It's so early. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, why guys. are you telling us we should be going back to work? I'm like, so guys, uh, I'm not telling you anything. I'm telling Actually, you what they're doing. <laughs> the Seattle, I don't know if how Redmond's done, but Seattle's done really well 
Yeah. Uh, they are yeah. kind of the yeah. poster child for successful mitigation of COVID-19 because they, they were right. aggre- they got a big hit early on and they were very aggressive. Yep. Although I will tell you the vaccination rules there are very odd. They're, they're <laughs> well, yeah, they're not doing as well on the vaccination oh, rate, they're not. I guess is what I, yeah. yeah. And I, I that, yeah. by the way, that, that is not necessarily their fault, right? I mean, right. they get what no. supply they no. get. I mean, who knows? Yeah, we ran out in uh, Northern California. Apparently, we ran out this week. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. But I think there's going to, but then there's also uh, all over the country this sense of glut. Like, mm-hmm. we've, we've got all these vaccines and, and no one else is coming in. So I don't, yeah. it's very uneven. It's uneven. Yeah, it needs to be it, it distributed is. better. Yeah. Yeah. No, and um, Seattle's been turning the tap on very slowly about who qualifies. Yeah. Um, Compared to like other places, compared to here anyway, like this week we moved to 50 and older and people right. being able to start going into drugstores right. if you have um, underlying conditions and getting the shot there. So we're we're pushing it pretty hard, which we should in New York since we're still a hotbed of COVID. Um, right. There's, there's, actually, I think since, yeah. three, since last week, my daughter was vaccinated and my son will oh, be vaccinated great. this oh, week. That's really great because there's students. So or, that's neat because, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. You know, um, there's so 27 it's million uh, doses of the vaccine coming out next week, which is a, like triple sure. what it was uh, a month mm-hmm. ago. So, yeah, it's right. starting to really flow. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I was given the choice of Johnson and Johnson or Moderna. I could get the single. Oh, you one. were? Huh. Yeah, and a number of our staffers mm-hmm. have gotten the single shot. John did, and uh, Jason. Which did. one is the single shot? Is that Johnson and Johnson? J and J. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, I think they just thought, well, I'll just get, I'll just get it on the done. I would take whatever they could give me, and well, then, of course, you yeah. should do that, you know. regardless. But if given a choice, no, I'm holding out for the good one. Uh, I held out for Moderna. <laughs> I said, no, I don't want change. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't mind coming back in a month. Mm. Well, um, and I want the 95. percent Thing is, it's, yeah. it's apples and oranges. It's, the tests were done at different times in different yeah, ways, I so it's, I don't think yeah. the numbers mean that much. Thing. Yeah. yeah, and who knows how these things are going to work against variants that are coming down the road. Well, and the main thing is your chance of getting uh, hospitalized and dying are practically zero if you've got the shot. Yeah. You may still get sick, yeah. but but right. and you may even right. feel pretty crappy, but you won't yeah. die. That's actually, To me, that's a good trade. I'll go for that. Yeah, I think it's a good trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> Let me – actually, okay, so I'll just give this as a cautionary tale. Um, I have a sister and uh, her husband who were both on the fence about vaccination and – we don't know what's in it. We don't know if it's safe. The husband is an educator, which just makes me crazy. Anyway, last week um, they finally decided, okay, Good. we're going to we're going to go Good. do this. And Good. the rest of the family was like, yeah, I was like, thank you. So I believe they got vaccinated on Friday. These people have a blended family that has they have at least six kids living at home at any given time. Wow. And uh, on Saturday they went to a soccer tournament, and oh. uh, now they all have COVID. Oh my god! Like yeah. literally. Every single person in this family has COVID. Uh, that's oh, man. why you get the Vex. Yeah. Yep. And it's like, uh, you know, if you had done this uh, a month ago when you could have, um, uh, this wow. wouldn't have happened. Oh. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh. Now, hopefully, because they were vaccinated, this the effects will be not as bad. That's, well, yeah, but yeah. it's not like it had much ch- much time to percolate. I know. I know. It's just that's, but that's. You know, this is what happens, guys. Nice. That's all. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. It's like uh, they declare a truce in a war and then you get killed. <laughs> it's like, guys, you don't want to be that guy. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be the one, one after down. the truce. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. you don't. The guy living on the island who thinks it's still going on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think it was an episode yeah. of Gilligan's Island, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other the other date on Microsoft to know is they've they're holding to the state they set last fall of July six as the campus is open. So what do you? Okay. It's silly to make a date a year. <laughs> I know. I don't that I don't yeah. get. I guess so. so obviously though, yeah. uh, what do they have? What uh, they they must be in the hundred sixty thousand range for a total employee. So maybe half of them in Redmond, right. something like that. Yeah, we, they don't expect 80,000 employees to show up no. on Ju- July 6th, right? So July 6th, no. What do you think that's going to look like really? I bet it's like half. Well, yeah. aren't they, there may even be rules. I don't know what, what the rules are in Redmond. Yeah. There may there be rules but I think about that, how many They're obviously going to. Yeah. yeah, they're going to be flexible. Yeah. They'll support the hybrid yeah, thing. Most people will that's work at home. 
Yeah. It doesn't Isaac's mean like week. they're telling people everyone has to come to work on July 6th at Red, in Redmond. That's not what it means. Right, like right. if you read their blog post on this, it's very nuanced and considered yeah. and lots of caveats, right? So it's not like a you're going in. I bet that's too. <laughs> Good timing on not getting a second headquarters, huh? Uh, Maybe uh, of, we're not going to need it anymore. Yeah, Salesforce, which is not making people come back in San Francisco, yeah. Yeah. of course, just build a massive new headquarters. And already, <laughs> so they're going to tear they're going to tear down the well, building. Or they they have other uh, office uh, leases, which they have in okay. some cases in San Francisco uh, canceled. Oh, geez. So, yeah. So um, I think well, I think it'd be foolish to take this to ignore this opportunity to rethink. Well, do we need people on prem? Do we need uh, yeah. big big buildings? What do we need to get the they job? Should turn done? The, these places should uh, turn into intranet versions of WeWork. Well, I think <laughs> in know? a lot of businesses, that's exactly what it is. Kind of hot. Also, desk Mary Jo has been stunned into silence. What's happening here? She decided to go home. <laughs> <laughs> She's not working anymore. Let's uh, right. let's. Uh, boy, this never happens with Zoom. I know. Mm-hmm. What oh. just happened? Oh, we oh, still hear you. We just don't. You're not moving. Your video is froze. There we go. Oh, She's back. Fixed. It's a magical I, I miracle. I got out and I got out and came back. Yeah. So I'm like okay. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I I think this is a good time for everybody to kind of rethink how mm-hmm. life should be post COVID. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what lessons we've learned in the last year, especially big companies. Mm-hmm. And not just say, well, we're just now it's going to go back the way it was. Maybe not. Maybe that's yeah. not the best way to go back. Right. Yeah. The benefits to not going back to exactly what you were doing before are enormous and obvious and far reaching, you know? Right. I mean, the world is a cleaner place <laughs> overall, right? Yeah, because less we traffic, have, uh, traveling, you know, and, you yeah. know, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, we our editors probably very much want to come in because it's a lot easier to use the hardware locally. They've been, you know, a lot of them have been coming in, uh, you know, anyway, Mm -hmm. um, just Mm -hmm. so they can do that. Uh, Engineers have to be here. But I think there's also team members that don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon had a live audience the other day. I think the world wants to know when, when are you going to have a live audience again? (laughs) Uh, We're not. I say <laughs> I'll announce it for the first time here. Yeah. Well, I okay. love having, you know, I'm a, yeah. I mean, I like having people mm-hmm. and I like seeing them and stuff, but it's, mm-hmm. it's a cost for us that right now we don't, we can't afford, which yeah. is because we have to have an additional employee, actually a security guard when they're expensive yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. at the front desk yeah. uh, to, to greet, welcome people. We have a waiver. They have to sign, assign them in to make sure that mm-hmm. they aren't armed. And uh, that kind of thing. I'm sorry, to make sure they aren't armed? Yes. <laughs> Is that what you said? Yeah. Armed? Oh, armed. Boy. Well, I, I don't think they really need to carry firearms into the studio. That's just my thought. I can't imagine why anyone would need to. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I just, uh, I guess uh, we just right now at this point, we really can't afford to do that. So I apologize to people who've been saying, oh, I can't wait till this is over. We want to mm-hmm. come sit in on, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Windows Weekly. But um it's expensive and it's just not, yeah. I miss sure. it because I really like meeting people and oh, it's yeah, fun for of course. me. Yeah. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, I probably won't get sick as much. <laughs> so no, well, that's the thing too, right? I mean, I, I, I think we talked about this earlier. I haven't been sick in over a year. I don't remember what it was. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I no, mean, it breaks yeah. my heart to it's say trade, that. There are trade offs, right? Yeah. The, the whole thing. <laughs> well, and that's, the, that's, a, that's again with the rethinking about uh, what we're doing and, and mm-hmm. um, where we want to spend our money and that kind of thing. And, uh, yeah. you know, COVID pretty hit us pretty hard. We had a lot of layout. We had something like 10 people and, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, and it's not come back yet. Yeah. So, Right. I don't know. You know, we just no. Have to... Even Microsoft, like I've seen people say, "Oh, good. If they think they can reopen the campus July 6th, that must mean in-person events for them will start right away." I don't. Think oh, they I wouldn't. Yeah, think I that. wouldn't draw that conclusion. <laughs> um, I wouldn't either. I don't even think I. I'll be surprised if Ignite Fall is an in-person event at all. I, yeah, I agree. Well, that's and, another thing. And why would... do these anymore? They worked so well. well not doing there's, live, there's right? still advantages to doing it live. I. I there are. They'll be hybrid, right? I, I think yeah. uh, it's not just about Microsoft. It's about the rest of the world. And mm-hmm. I think this year it makes sense not to do any live events of that scale. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
So, Especially when you bring good, people obviously. from all the different countries in That's what together. I mean, yeah. Well, but exactly. even that aside, I, I, a lot of uh, our hosts have said we like – especially the Apple hosts, they prefer mm-hmm. what Apple's been doing to the in-person yeah. things. They yeah. still want briefings and hands-on, yeah. but the yeah. information level of the videos is so much higher mm-hmm. uh, that they prefer that. Right. Certainly we right. like it because we can, we can co-stream it and comment on it as it's happening. Mm-hmm. And I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I don't think that stuff goes away. I, I think the thing that will change is in Apple's case, some people will go to an auditorium maybe, or yeah. In Microsoft's case, you know, we'll fly to whatever city it is that ignites in, and some of us, you know, but they'll still do the the streaming bit, and the, you know, yeah. yeah, I think so. I think so too. I hope so. I, I hope that's what we take so away from this, right? People. No, yeah. they've gotten so many more people to go to build and ignite now, like numbers wise. Mm-hmm. That why wouldn't right. they keep doing it that way? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that was always a problem with developer events is, you you know, you had to have a lottery because not everyone could fit. Now everyone who wants to can. That that just seems to make a lot more sense. I understand developers, I don't know, what do developers, they don't want to spend money on a plane ticket and a hotel, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right, right. Well, it might be fun sometimes, but yeah, I mean, uh, these events are prohibitively expensive. It depends Um, who's paying for it. If your business is paying for it, let's go party in New Orleans. (laughs) If you're paying for it, I think I'll stay home. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be very interesting. I can't wait to go to a concert. I know, me too. But it's not like I'm saying, well, I can't wait to go to an Apple event. (laughs) That's not, that's not (laughs) high on the, uh, the The place where I got, uh, vaccinated is the concert venue uh, of the cons, the last concert we went to before the pandemic. And I was like, we're sitting at, yeah. You know, you have to get the, you get vaccinated, you have to stay there for 15 minutes. So right. literally I was 10 feet away from the stage looking up the stage and I was like, oh, this man. show stinks. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird sensation. Yeah. Like here yeah. we are a year later. Mm-hmm. It feels like a bad sci-fi movie. Jeez. Oh, yeah. It, it looks like one. It's a, yeah. you know, it's like a hospital, uh, like mash unit, you know, from yeah. a sci-fi movie yeah. or something. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, there is a, 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 a digital transformation platform group now. Oh, Mary Jo must have had chills running over her back the whole time she was writing this article. What is oh, that? <laughs> her favorite topic. I called it YAR, yet another reorg. YAR. <laughs> Um, so they had a they had a reorg in Azure, and I wasn't really going to write about this because when I heard about it, I was like, yeah, they moved a bunch of people around and made up some new groups. So I don't think it'll have a lot of impact outside the company. And I didn't write about it for a week, and everyone kept pinging me and saying, why aren't you writing about the reorg? Why aren't you writing about the reorg? So I'm like, right. I guess I should write about the reorg. Um, <laughs> so the biggest thing to know about this is, Microsoft took a bunch of the teams that were already in Azure and they consolidated them into this new group called the Digital Transformation Platform Group. (laughs) Um, Uh, Also known as the DTPG. Under James Phillips, which is kind of interesting. James Phillips is the guy who's been in charge of Dynamics and the Power Platform. So now he's in charge of a lot of things. Um, he gets IoT and the AI platform and the data platform. They're all under James Phillips now. So like there's 15,000 people under this group inside of Azure. But in terms of impact on customers and impact in a bigger sense, I don't think it's going to have a huge – I don't think it's going to make any huge changes because everybody still reports up to Scott Guthrie um, – and, you know, it's just kind of moving people around inside. Nobody, as far as I know, is getting laid off because of this reorg. Um, yeah. So I guess I guess my takeaway from it was I think we're going to see more sales where Microsoft tries to bundle together and integrate things like IoT with Dynamics and AI and the data platform. Right. Right. That's about it. <laughs> Why do they do these? Uh, is it they suddenly a light goes on and they go, oh, you know, this the way we we're doing this isn't working? Yeah, or is it a change priorities within the company maybe? Uh, sometimes know? it's it's more subtle. It's like them saying, okay, look, Power Platform and Dynamics isn't as big as we think it should be. We uh, think we should be selling a lot more of this. So how can, we make, uh, how can we make it so that we sell more of this? Okay, what if we bundle it with stuff that is selling more like IoT and 
the data platform. That's my that's my pure guess about what they're doing. You know, if you ask them, they have this long corporate answer about customers, you know, doing what customers want, integrations, blah, 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 whatever. Okay. <laughs> I feel like, you know, uh, there there are like these eras at Microsoft, right? And we're right now, for yeah. better or worse, we're in kind of the digital transformation era. Right. And I, and, yeah. I, and in some ways, when you do this kind of thing, it gives people the ability to walk around and say, uh, hey, what, what are you doing for digital transformation? And it's like, uh, what? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah. And well, you're on the outside because that's what we're doing now. So <laughs> figured that yeah. out. And, I, and, I, I, and that kind of thing really does happen at Microsoft. You know, it does. Um, it does. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they they kind of, they want everyone to be on the same alignment or whatever. They do. They do. And, yeah. and then there's another person who also you, you a name to know if you're following Microsoft. Andrew Wilson is the other guy. So James Phillips gets all these teams over in Azure. Andrew Wilson is this guy who came to Microsoft a year ago from Accenture. And now he's the chief digital officer. And he's also in charge of core services engineering, which is Microsoft's internal IT department, right? For their own. Employees. Oh, interesting. Okay. So he has a he has a big job there at Microsoft, not not so much a customer facing job other than sometimes Microsoft uses its own work inside as a case study for customers. Sometimes they do that. But yeah, he's the other kind of big winner in this reorg, I'd say, is so Andrew Wilson and James Phillips are the two new big guns under Scott Guthrie. Basically. Yeah. Do you have it? Yar, yet another reorg. Yar. <laughs> Yar. Same as the last reorg. Uh, let's get an update on what Microsoft is calling the Hafnium hacks, because yeah. it sounds so much better than the Exchange Server hack. Well, I was going to say it doesn't have the word Exchange in it, so it's yeah. genius. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so in one week, we've gone from approximately seventy thousand vulnerable servers to thirty thousand. Um, that's a forty-three percent improvement. <laughs> so, or whatever um but they say that now uh, it's over 90 percent of all i assume these are on-prem exchange servers are now patched or at least mitigated so it's getting under control it's probably it's, like it's, the, it's, it's not the patch or the mitigation although that's yeah, good news yeah. it's that how many of those were compromised before they got patched sure. and sure. it's hard to know they're flattening the curve, Leo. I don't understand. The <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Remember those yeah. days where they held up the thing? To, what it was it? <laughs> Fifteen days to flatten the curve, and how optimistic we were. It'll oh. all be over by Easter. We yeah. were also young. <laughs> we were young, naive. We didn't know any better. What did we know? This can't happen in the twenty-first century. All right. Biggest story I think of the week is Pat Gelsinger's. Yeah. Uh, uh, Oh, my God. Release uh, yesterday. So we were speculating that Intel with the, and, and Intel's uh, board director said, we're going to wait till a new CEO gets in. Let him make yep. the decision. Speculation was maybe Intel will turn into a, um, you know, like a TS, uh, no, a, like an arm the, where they'll be designed, mm -hmm. but they'll have others, uh, third parties be the foundry. Now it turns out, mm -hmm. no, quite the opposite. They want to be the well, foundry. So they're, they're going to, but the funny thing is if you, if you had gone to a Roma people who care about this kind of thing and said, Hey, what do you think Intel's going to do? And you might've gotten five different responses. All five of them are true. <laughs> so oh, okay. like that, that's the thing that killed. <laughs> like it is fascinating to me that Intel is going to invest, I think it's $20 billion in uh, new factories in the United States. In Arizona. Yeah. Uh, in Arizona. Um, I, I, I mean, it's just, and he, he still sees this as one of Intel's biggest strengths, but they're also going to expand the use of third-party fabs. Oh, um, so they can race to this nine nanometer uh, milestone, right? Oh, that's the problem. They can't get past the the fourteen nanometers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're also going to, and this is it, it was really interesting. They called this out. Um, they are going to be working on x86 designs, of course. They're going to be working on wrist designs. They're going to be working on arm designs. They literally said that. They said they wanted to get Apple's business back. Uh, which is insanity. That's that's never going to happen. I'm sorry. That's not not how Apple works. Um, but I, I this is worth watching. There's a you know a video. Uh, it was like the keynote event from this virtual event that they had yesterday. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Just look up you know Intel event or Pat Gelsinger or whatever. Hmm. It's worth watching. Um, it, it's it's very very interesting. And he he talks about their failure to get past uh, 10 nanometer. Um, 
plainly. I mean, he just, you know, this is like we, he kind of explains this is what we did wrong. He and was very forthright. I was yeah. impressed. I thought actually. so. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. It's worth seeing. Like I said, it's worth watching. I guess easy to do if you've only been there a month. You can just say, my predecessors really screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, if I had been here, this yeah. would never have happened. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I think, you know, I'm reading um, Ben Thompson's Stratechery in which he says, yeah. uh, this is, uh, Intel did exactly what I was thinking they should do. Oh, well. um, okay. You know, um, they, there is almost a split of the company. Um mm. They, they, he he only fessed up to the nano, the the process problem. He he's, right. he he said the seven nanometer process is even more delayed than we admitted last year. You know, well, I mean, they're t- the thing they're talking about seven nanometer at scale for two thousand twenty three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, their their competitors are all in five and seven already, um, and maybe lower. What's it? What's Apple on now? Is it five or three? Or I don't even know. But. Um, they're, yeah, so uh, they're you know, trying they to get have, they're trying to get Apple, for instance, to bring them the M1 business. It's like, hey, why yeah. are you having Taiwan make it? And you know, there right, may, that right. may be credible if they have fabs in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, also in Europe, right? So, I, spreading fabs out, uh, uh, making those things geographically diverse, I think is smart. Now, Europe and the United States are the literally the most expensive places on earth to build anything. Um, right. so that's, uh, we'll see how that goes, I guess. But Intel has a lot of, uh, I don't know. Is there a price advantage to building in these, uh, in Asia, uh, or China? I, I, I feel like it's such high, highly skilled labor. It's not, we're not right. talking a massive workforce right. that'll work for $4 a day. I mean, this is going to be hard and expensive no matter where you do it. I think mm. maybe not. I don't yeah, know. I don't, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't yeah. know. But I, I'm fast, you know, cause I look, I, if we had gone back a week or two and we had a conversation about this, I'm sure we said or would have said something to the tune of why on earth would they not be getting rid of all their manufacturing facilities? Well, that's point? right. Like, that's what I was saying is that uh, the initial speculation you know, was they would just become yeah. design companies. But he sees this as a core uh, benefit well, or core advantage of Intel. They're not, they're the only big chip fab company that doesn't, it's not in Asia. It's not in China. So there right. is there. I, I think he's he's kind of betting on geopolitics, and mm-hmm. saying this well, is going to be for companies like Apple. This is going to be they're watch and see. They're a gonna, selling point made in the USA. Yeah, made in the USA. It, it might also work with governments. I could picture the EU and the United States both giving them uh, you know whatever it is tax benefits or mm-hmm. some financial incentive to do what they're doing. Right. Um, bringing in this country in particular, the, this whole notion of made in the USA, uh, is, uh, you know, is, is a big thing right now. Um, I, I just pulled, you know, get those trays at Dunkin' Donuts for the drinks. And I just pulled one off the top and it had four holes in the bottom instead of places for the drinks. To, you know what I mean? And I literally blurted out to nobody in particular made in the USA. That, that's what my reaction to that was. <laughs> now, this was made in the United now, States. Now, now, Paul. <laughs> no, I know. I'm just saying. So, you know, there's a, there's a hump we have to get over here. Um, so we'll see. Uh, it's, it, I think it's a gutsy gamble maybe i don't know but i it feels like maybe he's thinking or they're thinking um that there's going to be a market for not you know that given the geopolitical situation with china that mm. the tensions with china that maybe right. there's going to be a market mm. for chips made for, in europe for chips made in europe and in the u.s for chips made in the u.s it may become part of a trade war that it, it yeah. may not it may be so he's making a bet, uh, for, yeah. you know, he's yeah. making a bet uh, yeah. that, that this is going to, this is going to be what's happening uh, globally. Sure. Um, there, and, now, and that, didn't, he, didn't he also say that they'll license out um, the x86 proprietary um, information to anybody who wants to make those yeah. chips? Now anyone. That to me was crazy. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> it's basically doing as ARM has done with the ARM architecture, right. licensing right. the x86 architecture. But it, you that know just that's... feels so, so, so like, it would be like Microsoft saying, you know what? Everybody wants to make Windows. Here yeah. we go. We're going to open source, source Windows. Windows. Right. But, here's, <laughs> but yeah. here's one of the customers that might be interested in this, Microsoft. Right. You know, what? Yeah. one of the things we always yeah. talk about, the advantage Apple has with its own chips is now they make mm-hmm. the entire yeah. stack, they make the operating system, they make the hardware, they make the chips, yeah. that they can make everything sing in harmony. Mm-hmm. And yeah. one other company could do that, the company that makes Windows, which is Microsoft. Right. 
Uh, they already make computers. They already make the operating system. What they don't make is the chips. If, what if you know they they license the x86 architecture? Maybe even have mm-hmm. Intel fab it, but they design it. Mm-hmm. I think that's mm-hmm. an interesting play for Microsoft, and I I guarantee mm-hmm. you they're thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I, I, I would go even Microsoft. further. Yeah, well, I mean, you? I would say you know Qualcomm, for example. And Microsoft yeah. could maybe together look at this and say, yeah. does it make sense? Well, why even bring Qualcomm the, in? Because Qualcomm makes the chipsets. I mean, no, no, but Intel's going to well, be the foundry. So you license x86, mm-hmm. you customize it to match what exactly what mm-hmm. Windows needs, nothing more, nothing less. You make it a super Windows chip. You don't need Qualcomm. Mm-hmm. You make it Intel well, I, makes Okay, it. I was thinking for more, in other words, we have this issue where x86 code runs poorly on ARM on Windows. Right. What if this could benefit that? Uh, well, I think, in effect, Microsoft does its its own. Yeah, so like a, like a hybrid Silicon. ARM x86. Well, Silicon. whatever works best for Windows, they yeah. can decide. Yeah. yeah. Um, it would be an interesting <laughs> response to Apple. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, hey, I well, mean, I, I don't feel like Microsoft is all in on anything like that. You know, it's know. Uh, it's, it's not a know. small their, market, but it, yeah. No, and also they're making their own custom chips, but the, I feel like they're making them for things that are not x86, right? Like they're working yeah, on I, like data center I, chips. That's the stuff they're doing like, with Qualcomm. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You know, it's a big deal because know. they it chase runs off gamut, their sure. OEMs. You know, they're big, yeah. you know, I'm not that the OEMs can go Well, unless else. they could license them back to them. I mean, why not? Why they're going to, they're making right. Windows PCs. Oh, yeah. what if these oh, things were yeah. cheaper than. Right. Like you know, what if HP, like so let's just say HP wanted to take the x86 proprietary code yeah. information and do something. Specific, yeah, like any PC maker could right? try to make some advantage for their own stuff. Problem is you have yeah. to have designers. So that's going to be right. the yeah. gating yeah. factor. Does Microsoft have good. A good chip team. Well, we don't, I think they, they, might. they have a lot of people have, working on. They have uh, thousands of people, yeah. I yeah. think, on, who are doing silicon. At there you go. Point, on all different. So places. that's why it's, they're the natural for this. They make the OS, yeah. right. so they understand that intimately. That's what Apple did. They they said got the OS makers and the chip makers together, right. and they said, "What do you need? What what can we do?" Mm-hmm. And they did mm-hmm. things specifically in the architecture that weren't part of ARM. That were specifically right. in the architecture mm-hmm. to support the way. Uh, Swift works and the ma- way Mac OS works. Or so iOS. now we need a camera at these fabs to watch for Panos Panay <laughs> to be walking in. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. What would be the downside? You, you, I guess if you license it to uh, Lenovo, Dell, and HP, you're, you're, up, you're cool there. It's a risk. And Surface you is not a big part of it. Right. Yeah, I, it's make sure this is they maintain compatibility. Down, Micro, see, this uh, is but the risk for Microsoft has always been legacy. Always. They were they were aggressive once with Surface, it backfired. Now they are always yeah. one gen behind on chipsets right. and stuff. Yeah. And I mean ultimately yeah. the the reason the PC market works is the reason gasoline cars all work or whatever. It's because you can, it, it all works with every yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you know manufacturer you use, mm-hmm. what model. It all works. If Microsoft's thing is a little different and and maybe it is a little better in certain ways, if it's not if it doesn't, you know, 100% work, it, it just becomes a non-starter. Uh, right. I think licensing yeah. x86, though, opens the door to a competitor. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Amazon could, you know, there are big companies with chip designers, I would imagine, mm-hmm. uh, or uh, that could acquire a team. I bet you, though, that that is also, you know, a brain, that is also, a, there's a, a limiting factor, which is there are only so many really good chip people. Mm-hmm. Right. <clears throat> you got to watch for hires, you know, mm-hmm. people stealing engineers from uh, Apple and, mm-hmm. and ARM and, and Intel. Be very, it's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. It does, you know, this Intel's, you know, for all their troubles, they're still a market maker. They could change uh, yeah. how this all works. It, that's the thing. And and for all the Intel is doomed stuff that is uh, rolls so easily off everyone's lips, you know, it's like this company is still 80% of the market. Like yeah. they... Um, I and I've said this before. I, I really feel like the bigger threat to Intel is not the PC; it's you know from ARM in general. It, it's the data center. I, that's mm. the big market for Intel that they could lose. I don't think the PC market goes away for them. I think they'll always have a big chunk of that. But uh, data center is important, and um, I think that's you know. The, and he talked about that too. They're working on hybrid chipsets and. Blah blah blah, whatever. You know, but they're gonna when we had uh, as well. 
when we had uh, Josh and uh, Ryan on last week, they exhibited something that Pat Gelsinger referred to the Grovian culture. <laughs> the Grovian. That's what that's what uh, Gelsinger <laughs> called it. The, the Andrew, Gro- you know, Andy Grove. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, that Grover from Sesame Street. The like confidence in our execution, he said. <laughs> our teams are fired up. We said we're going to yeah. do uh, X and we do a 1.1 X every time we make a commitment. That's the intel mm-hmm. culture that we are bringing back. And I saw that enthusiasm, frankly, in both Ryan and Josh. We were yeah. kind of surprised when we said, well, what mm-hmm. about the M1? And they said, mm-hmm. yeah, that's great. That's going to be a spur to even better stuff from us. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's exactly what Gelsinger referred to. We have confidence that we're going to, I'm quoting him now, going to meet mm-hmm. not just the existing customers, that we're going to be leaders in the market and we're going to satisfy the new foundry customers because the world needs more semiconductors and we're going to step into that gap in a powerful and meaningful way. He called it the Grovian culture. That's. Int- I think that's, I mean, I love hearing that. Mm-hmm. I kind of enjoyed it when, you know, Ryan and, and, and Josh were going, yeah, we're going to, yeah. We love well, the thing I've been, you know, I, so I, having spoken to these folks privately in the past and I, and watching the coverage of this stuff out in the world and watching people's reactions and comments on my own site or whatever, it's always like Intel's running scared. Intel's using oh, yeah. fake benchmarks or they use blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, they're not, <laughs> this is not what they're like. Like I, 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 yeah. I've been trying to say that all along. I mean, I, I this is not, I was just talking to someone yesterday about this, you know, like uh, in, in, Intel's on a, a PR blitz. And I'm like, P- PR blitz. Intel has one yeah. page on their website about this <laughs> and they've been late coming back to me about everything I've ever asked for. They're not, they're not hammering the world with information. They're just, I, I, I don't understand. Like people have this <laughs> weird attitude about everything. And it's like, I, yeah. they're, com- they're responding to a competitive threat in, in a way that I think is yeah. credible and correct. And, and they're not, they're not like, hey, uh, Paul, how much do we have to pay you for a good review? <laughs> you know, I mean, the first thing no, I, I said to them was like, look, you're not going to necessarily win this contest. And they're like, yeah, we just right. want you to be honest. You know, mm-hmm. that's they've been like couple, this from the moment one. And I had a couple guys on Twitter today saying to me, yeah, you know, sure. They, like Andy, like uh, Andy Grove, <laughs> like, like Pat Gelsinger thinks a- Apple's going to come back after those horrible ads they ran last week. I'm like, guys, ads are ads. They it's don't care. Business. <laughs> it's business. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, you, do you think Tim Cook is mad about the Justin Long ad? He doesn't Honestly, care. I can't believe that Apple's executive suite didn't look at that and just kind of nod their heads like, yeah, that was pretty good. Or just <laughs> to know? be like, yeah, whatever. And so yeah, go, it's fine. Goodbye, yeah. You know? But these are big boys. Maybe Steve Jobs might have acted that way. That, was, I, sure. I wanted to say that, but I didn't want to start another holy war yeah. on yeah. Tim, Tim Cook is a, Tim Cook has his big boy pants uh, on. Yeah, he does. Although one thing uh, we, we agreed on uh, yesterday yesterday on MacBreak Weekly is Justin Long will never work for Apple again. Okay. That, he's the, but he doesn't wow. care. He cashed in. Persona right? non grata. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was the, I'm a, you know, I'm the Mac guy. No, I know. He, and, uh, he also played, didn't he play Steve Jobs in a TV movie or maybe, something? Maybe, I don't know. He could. <laughs> he kind of has that look. Maybe I'm thinking of something A else. youthful look. Yeah. Um, he know. looks Paul, like Paul says bit. this a lot. You say this a lot. You're like, people ascribe like like attitudes and feelings to yeah, companies like they're and, humans and, they're like, not they don't have yeah. them. No. they don't think no. like that no. microsoft <laughs> wants you to believe you know it's like my, my, <laughs> microsoft what yeah. what are you talking like, about you know i mean I know. look bill gates kind of influenced corporate culture at yeah. microsoft sure. steve jobs sure. certainly did yeah but when you those are that's founder culture when founders leave right. yeah uh then it becomes a business and businesses yeah. don't hold grudges so much that's, I mean, people and teams can get mad about stuff, but at the end, they're just like, no, no, it's, it's, it's like, um, <laughs> oh, this is rich. Microsoft talking about antitrust. Are you kidding me? And it's yeah. like, guys, uh, first of all, uh, there are no more bigger experts on antitrust than Microsoft. So actually, maybe we should pay attention sure. to what they right. have to say. But, right. but also, that's like saying, like, I'm never going to Germany because of what they did in the 1940s. And it's like, okay, at some point, <laughs> you just got to get over this because- I know. Different people, generations later, things yeah. change. Yeah. Come on, yeah. You know, I still won't buy a Volkswagen though. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, me <laughs> no, but um, no, I'm, I'm just, kidding. I'm just kidding. I've owned. I I've drove owned an Audi for four many years. Volkswagens in my life. Many, actually, many years. Yeah, um, my first car. Yeah, it was an Opel. Yeah, mine too. From Germany, for wow. our first family car was a Volkswagen. So I guess we. My first car was a '72 Volkswagen Super Beetle. Oh, Super Beetle. <laughs> when they do an electric Beetle, man, I'm in. 
Yeah, that's well, coming. It is. They've said their, uh, no more yeah. gas vehicles for uh, VW Audi. Sure. That's it. Come on, you're never turning in that Mustang. Admit it. I love my Mach E. <laughs> looking at it right now with hearts. Boom, boom. <laughs> love that Mach E. Um, all right, let's see. Let, uh, should I take a break now? Let's take a break now. Then Windows 10, web browsers, Xbox. There is much more to talk about with Paul Therott, Mary Jo Foley, or as I call them, Paulie Walnuts and Mary Jo Spaghetti. That's their mob <laughs> names. Yep. They all mobbed up, man. Our show today brought to you by this little sucker here. Can I show you this little sucker? It's so tiny. It's so little. You probably would go, well, what is that? It's just a little black box on your desk. About the size of a little hard drive, maybe. That there, friends, that is what we call a, a honeypot. And that is the hacker's worst nightmare. Our show is brought to you by the folks who make that, Thinkst. They call it a canary, like a canary in a coal mine. We were just talking about how, okay, you've mitigated your exchange server exploit. You're patched. But the big problem is what happened when you weren't patched? Did they get in? And this is nowadays the big problem for every company is are hackers already in your network? The advanced persistent threat. That's why you need canaries. Companies almost always find out way too late that they've been compromised. And often after they've spent millions on IT security, nowadays it's even worse. Bad guys get in your network. They plant ransomware bombs, but before they set them off, they download compromising material so they can doubly extort you. You really need an early warning system. That's what the canary is. They're designed to look like the things hackers want to get into. They can be deployed anywhere on your network, and you can make them look like anything you want. A router, a switch, a NAS server. That's what mine looks exactly like, a Synology box. When you, when you, when you see it, when you go to its IP address, you get the Synology login. If you're a suspicious hacker, you look at the MAC address. Oh, yeah, it's a Synology MAC address. It appears exactly like a Synology, but the minute they try to log into that, I get an alert, and I know somebody's in the network. It could be a Linux box. It could be a Windows server, and not just any Windows server. You can pick the year you want. You can pick the services you want. You can light it up like a Christmas tree, or you can just have some specific services on there. You can put fake files on them. You can enroll them in Active Directory. And the minute hackers investigate, they give themselves away and you are notified. They also can generate canary tokens. And we do this too. I love this idea. So you can use the canary boxes in your network to generate these files, PDFs, docs, whatever you want, and sprinkle them around. Now, these are just files. They're not pieces of hardware. I have a few spreadsheets called, you know, employee records or... <laughs> Depends how blatant you want to be. Social security numbers, that's probably a little too obvious. Uh, you get to pick it. PDFs, you know, that say uh, password, fi <laughs> password file, whatever. The minute those files are, are opened, it pings the canary, which pings me. They're like leaving little trip wires all over, and you can make as many as you want, hundreds, thousands, whatever you want to do. The Thinks Canary philosophy is Trivial to deploy with a ridiculously high quality of a signal. That's important, too. You're not going to get flooded with alerts. In fact, my canary's been dead silent for a year. That's good. <laughs> That's good. I, it did get triggered. Somebody, uh, Megan, years ago was reviewing, not years ago, maybe a couple of years ago, was reviewing a uh, network-attached storage device. Won't say the name of the company, but for some reason it decided to ping all the other devices on the network. What? And as soon as I got that ping, I knew we had, and in fact, I got the IP address that was pinging and was inside the network. We were able to track it down immediately and disconnect it because of the canary. Canary will notify you in any way you find uh, effective. Yeah, not, not, won't inundate you. You can get an email. You can get a text message. You'll get a console when you get the canaries. You can use Slack, webhooks, syslog. Uh, they have an API. So if you want something even more custom, you choose what works best for you. It's important. Companies know two things when it comes to data breaches. One, hackers usually take the path of least resistance. That's usually your staff, right? And they're going to get in. Maybe they're going to find that exchange server and, and you, haven't, you didn't patch it right away because you didn't know. 
Two, it takes on average 191 days for a company to realize there's been a data breach. No, you need to know on day one. On day one, as soon as the bad guys start exploring your network, the canary will let you know. And these guys know what they're doing. They've been in the security game for 20 years plus. They've trained companies, militaries, and governments how to break into networks. And they use that expertise to build the canary. They think like hackers, so they made canaries that are... They don't look vulnerable to hackers. They look valuable. The canaries are deployed all over the world on all seven continents. I'll give you a pricing example at canary.tools slash twit. It's 7500 bucks for five canaries per year. You get, uh, as I mentioned, a hosted console. You get all the upgrades, the support, uh, maintenance. If you sit on a canary and it breaks, <laughs> they're not that. If you step on it. If an elephant steps on it, if it breaks for any reason, they'll just send you a new one. No questions asked. That's part of the deal. Use the code TWIT in the How Did You Hear About Us box. If you will, that way we'll get credit for it, and you will get 10% off your canaries forever, for life. So that's a big savings. There's a very generous two-month uh, trial period. You get a two-month money-back guarantee So, and, and a full refund, by the way. So you can try it and just see. Just see. But don't be surprised if you don't hear anything. That's good. And when you do hear something, that's something you want to sit up and take notice of. Thinkst Canaries. I cannot recommend these more highly. Cana they're just they're fantastic. And I'm not alone. Everybody agrees. Canary.tools slash twit. This uh, look, security is a layered process, but the one of the most important layers is a little canary in the coal mine there to let you know somebody got in. If you don't, and you know how, you don't know, right? That's that's bad. Canary.tools slash twit. The code twit, very important. Make sure you do that so they know you saw it on Windows Weekly. Uh, let's see. Windows 10 News. Is there any, are there new builds? Anything to tell? There is a new build. There is a new build. Tell Mary Jo, did you notice the difference? <laughs> There's a new folder. A new icon. folder. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, look at that folder icon. Oh, my God, look, look at like, those. Like, does it look like Brad? <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 What is the it, new folder? It looks nice. It looks better than the notepad icon. Oh, you mean it's a new folder, new, new folder icon? New, uh, many new folder icons, like the yes. special folders, yes. like documents and oh, cool. downloads and music. Yeah. And are they beautiful? Inside a file explorer, lovely. right? I think they're nice. Yeah. What they are is flat. By the way, so like yeah. when yeah, you think about thing. things like yeah. if anyone's watching this on a computer, you can look up and look at the recycle bin icon. And that's not literally from Windows Vista because that one was kind of round, if I remember correctly, but yeah. it is angled. And if you think about icons like the one for uh, Notepad today with the glass cover, it, it's mm. it's at an angle, right? It kind of it's it's <laughs> right. like looking down over there, you know, yeah. for some reason. Yeah. Um, a lot of the newer icons are flat. And they're, you know, mm -hmm. so they're facing forward, I guess, if that makes any sense. And these icons are all like that. And the drive icons are like that now. Actually, that makes me, yeah, if you look at um, a drive icon in Internet, um, sorry, in File Explorer, it's doing the same thing. It's it's off, you know, mm -hmm. it may literally, that icon is probably not literally from Windows Vista, but that's when that style of icon was kind of big. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think this is just another hint of the, Little hint, but, uh, you know, some of the visual changes that we can expect in this yeah. Sun Valley update, you know, coming in the second mm -hmm. half of this year. Fluent, fluent looking. Right? <laughs> yes, I guess so. Is it fast I and guess. fluid? Maybe. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, and then the, there was a, a, some changes in the sandbox, which I thought were kind of interesting. Yeah. Right? So what is that like a Windows sandbox and... Curiously, what Microsoft Defender Application Guard are both based on container technology. Yep. And they were using a runtime that used to match the host's version of the operating system. And now they have a, a lighter weight and faster new runtime just for containers. Um, so there should be no functional differences. It shouldn't impact right. compatibility, but the performance should be better. But no one cares about that, Mary Joe. Look at the new icons. What are you talking about, containers? Now, What's wrong with you? Look at the list of fixes <laughs> in today's build, by the way. Yeah. There are yeah, like yeah. so many fixes in today's build. <laughs> yep. And if you're a PC gamer, watch out for this build, right? There's some compatibility issues, I believe, if, if you look in known issues. But yeah. You'd have to be crazy if you're, you know, using your computer for anything serious like a game I know. I know. to be on the anything insider. Anything serious like a game. 
Yeah. yeah. No, I know people do it though. People crazy use their, like a fox. Like, regular <laughs> PC, yeah. and they're like, yeah. it broke everything. I'm like, yeah. So you're running a test build on it. Okay. There are some known <laughs> issues for sure. Yeah. Yeah, there are. There. Are. Well, but, but yeah, it's nothing. A, nothing a too huge. Build, yeah. Nothing too huge. It's another dev channel build. Well, nothing yeah. too huge, but there are changes at least, right? So I last know, week we true. saw that's several true. changes. I mean, I feel like all of a sudden. It had been quiet Things for a while. Moving. Yeah. 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 I know. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Uh, are we getting close to 21H1? Is that? <laughs> is that Every day. A little closer. Close. little inching. <laughs> it inching. feels like. Zeno's paradox is what feel it feels like. It does feel like inching. Yeah. It does. It does. Yeah. So uh, they now are at the, quote, commercial pre-release validation stage, which, it, which means if you're a business, and you want to, and you're maybe not on the insider program, or not everyone's on the insider program, and you want to start kicking the tires and checking it out. You can download this release and see how it how it works for you. Twenty one H one. But I, you Whatever know, somebody asked means. me, is it is it in the release preview ring yet? And I'm like, you know, I I don't. think it is. By the way, is I it? Think, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Because um, I wasn't fact, sure I think that it was. was part. Yeah. <laughs> So let me see if I can find that. Um, I believe it yeah, is. Um, yeah. So the way they made this available is you can download the ISO. Um, oh, yeah, you're yeah, right. Users the- who rely on release preview insider channel can go to the update yes, setting page, getting right. it from there. Um, or you can get it through Windows Update, right? Isn't that another way mm-hmm. you can get it? There's a lot of different channels they're trying to test for it. You know, you know what's crazy? For a tiny build, this is like a minor, right. very minor feature update. They are still doing all the full, you know, verification right. and validation on this thing. So, well, um, you know, how else could they pretend it was a feature update if they <laughs> if know, they didn't act like you know? No, and also I shouldn't make light of that because small, even a small update could really hose compatibility yeah. and create a lot of problems. Right. So it's good they're doing this. Somebody asked me if this means it's about to roll out to the mainstream, and I I'm guessing we're still like a couple months away from that. Really thinks so, uh, really. Somehow slow the wheels. So, turn. like release pre- <laughs> the its appearance in the release preview. Does that suggest any kind of timing? Is that? Um, I don't think so. Two weeks, six weeks. Suggests, no, no, I don't think so. Um, I okay. my guess is they'll time this around build maybe and build. I'm wow. guessing is May. I build. Maybe they'll they announce s- it. The the dates leaked. It was like the end of May. Well, those were maybe right. Oh okay. Yeah, maybe dates. May, there's a possibility okay. build is May 25th to 27th, but they haven't announced that officially, and there's no official site that has that information yet. Okay. But I, I'm I'm guessing they would try to roll this out earlier in May um, if they're going to start rolling it out to the mainstream. So, yeah. But what about those new icons, Mary Jo? Really? I mean... <laughs> Don't pay attention to the 21H1. Look at the shiny icons <laughs> over here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Yeah. We say that every single show. We've been saying that for like. Oh, it's true. Months, right? We're getting closer. Yep. Uh, browser time. Yeah. What are the. One of the fears with Microsoft adopting Chromium is that Google will one day slam the door shut on them somehow and this will all become a huge problem. But uh, maybe this will help you feel a little bit better about that, maybe. Uh, and that's that Microsoft and Google and, and a few others. I don't know if you folks have ever even heard of Egalia. No, what's that? I, yeah. Oh, Algolia. Uh, a- okay. A-G-O-L-I-A? No, I- I-G-A-L-I-A. No. I-G-A. No, no, what's that? Is anyway, that a browser? Part of it as well. No, I, there's something to do with the web uh, developer community, I think. But no, not they're they're that. partnering to make uh, improvements to browser compatibility, cross browser compatibility, in five key areas. All of them are related to CSS, and you can do like uh, there's some huge percentage of websites that are based on something called the CSS Flexbox, for example. Different browsers render those things differently. So this is kind of like back in the old days, you know, best viewed on Netscape Navigator or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and they want to make sure that these things are all consistent across browsers. So they've identified for this particular initiative the top five compatibility issues, which they're going to try to solve together and make sure that these things work consistently across all browsers. 
um, unfortunately, um, Mozilla is not officially part of this, although they participated in this kind of effort in the past. And of course, Apple's not part of this either. So that's kind of a problem, but, um, you know, we'll see. It, it, I like, I like seeing Microsoft and Google do stuff together, mm-hmm. uh, in this way. So hopefully this kind of continues. Cool. What else do we have? They're here? not going to abandon. I mean, even if they abandon Chromium, it's open source. So just fork it and keep on going. I don't. I don't I, yeah, I think. I, I think the way this is going to go down, and we've already seen a little bit of this, is Google will start pulling things out of Chromium that they want. Yeah, they've already started Chrome. doing that. Yeah, yeah. So they'll be they'll be that kind of work. Yeah, Actually, but Microsoft's. Com- I think if anybody fully capable of replacing those bits with their own bits. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And fact, I'd love to see them contribute it back to. Chromium project. Wouldn't yes, that be and they've cool? done an amazing job with that, yeah, Microsoft. Yeah, 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 they have. Um, if you're uh, are deaf or hard of hearing, hearing sorry, um, this feature might be kind of interesting on Chrome. There's something they're calling it live caption, uh, which is a feature oh, they've had on Android for a while. Such now, which, a good feature. Mm-hmm. Does yeah, your son use, use Android? Yes. Uh, no, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. Because no, he, he would. Yeah. Oh, my God. As There's been a couple things on Android. As start watching a video or anything, I know. I've, I've, yeah. the yeah. captioning pops up. It's usually very high quality. Mm-hmm. Right. It's mind-blowing. Right. I use it. I yeah. think it's really good. Yeah. 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 If, yeah. Uh, we've used, you know, you, you can see automatic captioning in like uh, YouTube, for example. And, it, you know, the quality it's not kind as of good varies. YouTube, but it's, which is funny because yeah. it's a Google product. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. No, I'm not saying switch to Google or anything like that, but <laughs> this looks like a good feature. So, yeah, just wanted to throw that out if you're are a Google guy or gal, I guess. Um, Google y. Yeah, it's funny because right, what about those one pluses, though, guys? Let's. Just oh, now reason. Jason had a review of it yesterday and all about Android <laughs> and was yeah. underwhelmed. Did just he like on it? paper. Really? No, he didn't like it, but on paper, it looks oh. really good. Uh, Marquez so, Brownlee was saying there's severe shutter lag with the camera, which well, that wouldn't be. But that's fixable, I would guess. Okay. okay. Right. I think they look pretty, I've pretty good, good. I've seen good things overall. I mean, I, I, I've well, reviewed. Ha- it's not a Hasselblad camera. That's a licensed okay. name. Give me a break. Okay, but <laughs> yes. But I mean, there. but the camera is the only thing, the only major thing where OnePlus phones have fallen apart for me in the past. Yeah, and um, it's not important. The last one otherwise. was so inconsistent. I wrote yeah. a story about it, like how inconsistent right. it was. It was crazy. Like right. I've done things like you take a picture of like the, the cup here on the desk, you tap on the, the the cup to focus it, you take the photo. When you look at it on the phone, it's a tiny screen, so you're like, okay, it's probably fine. And then you go back and look at it later, and it focused on something in the background instead, and it's like, guys, I, what, <laughs> what what is this? <laughs> um, and so we'll see. I. I don't think it's fair to expect OnePlus to suddenly vault into the top two or three um, no, camera the, makers. You know, this is a mid-range phone at four hundred bucks. I mean, they make a, a pro, but no, but the, ex, the top end one is like over a thousand yeah, bucks. No, it's a thousand bucks. Yeah. yeah, it looks uh, to me. I have, I'm, I'm getting one uh, tomorrow. I think so. I'll nice. you know I'll be cool. reviewing it. But I um, this has always been the Achilles heel for OnePlus. So I I, I really hope they get this right. Mm. I'm cautiously you need a new optimistic. Phone. That's why. That's yeah. why I'm yeah, yeah. asking about this. <laughs> yeah, and you don't want you don't want to go from a high end Google Pixel, Pixel to a right. Like, are they even going to do another Pixel this year? Do we even? Know? Yeah, but it, it but it will probably be another mid range thing, and I don't know. Yeah, you know. I know. I know. So I'll let you know. I'll let you know. I I, I think it's going to be good. I, I I don't know if it's going to be. You know, top top of the line it, I, that's why i wouldn't get the 1100 dollars one i think the mid-range probably if you're in a mid-range yeah. uh, category is a good choice. the only thing you're losing is the telephoto lens and honestly OnePlus has never done telephoto right. well don't um, you yeah. mary joe you don't get it for the camera anyway right you're not a, i do i only get it for the camera oh you only get it for the camera that's all i care about is, R- the camera. is that true really yeah I mean, as pictures weird as of Sirachi, this is, cat what are you, pictures cat and pictures, beer pictures and guys? beer pictures oh of course duh that's yeah. it duh that's it no, I don't care about call quality. I'm, I almost never use. No, who call uses quality? a phone for a phone? That's nuts. That's crazy talk. That's just crazy uh, talk. Honestly, right? I still have the <laughs> Pixel Four, and I'm very happy with the Pixel Four. I know. Well, I have the Pixel Three XL. That's how old my phone yeah. is. That's why I need a new. But phone. it's but this is the same camera as in the Four, and not much different than the Five. I know. So I don't. So know. that yeah. uh, the Pixel Four with an ultra wide lens, in addition to what's there, would be almost perfect. Um, 
Yeah. If they announce it, it'll be in this uh, like May summer, right? Next couple. Well, of months. that the yeah. the one they announced in May is going to be a like a five A. Oh, that's right. They do the so A in that, the middle. Oh. It's and then not it's October when or September, right? When they do the. I know you didn't. You um, looked at the Samsung last what August or September, whatever that was, and were not yeah. impressed, Mary Jo. Is that right? I don't because like the those... Samsung ecosystem. Exactly. I, I don't like that. I'm with you. Yeah. It's the, honestly, but the camera, the cameras thing. have gotten good. Oh, I mean, the cameras they, are great. They Except tend that to, they oversaturate. Yes, the they do. They bit. do HDR it up. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. See, I care about the camera. No, you do. No, You're paying I attention. Notice these so, uh, well, it's not I would like say fluent icons or something. The like stuff I've seen so far. <laughs> okay, <geez. laughs> um, yeah, who cares although the that? icons in File Explorer, I just again <laughs> very colorful. Um, but no, I, I feel like the, the color accuracy of the OnePlus looks similar to that of the iPhone. Yeah. I think that's the closest comparison. Oh, really? And huh. yeah, that's from what I've seen so far. I'll see for myself. Yeah, but, I don't blame uh, you for being intrigued. I would. I, I actually hovered my finger over the buy button. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But I like the green one. I hope I get a green yeah. one. The green one's pretty, yeah. but then yeah. you put a case on it and who cares, right? That's true. That's true. Watch All About Android yesterday. I think Jason okay. did his review then. Okay. Uh, and then he will do a hand. And I want to hear what Paul thinks too. Yeah. Like he, he and I usually, but not always agree on phones. Yeah, Paul's but, no, I, like no, I totally he trust a pixel Paul more than I do. What yeah. have what have been our major disagreements? <laughs> do you remember? Pixels, you hate the pixels. pixels. You don't like the pixel? No. no, what do you mean? I've I've always used pixels. No, you don't you always put it down and say Google's phone? You know, kind of crap. No, I've I've always used a pixel. That's what I use. Yeah. Okay, okay. I thought you were more down on the pixel. No, 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 no. I'm using one now. I'm using pixel, a pixel, pixel four kinda, five G. Yeah, pixel kind of is the. Standard. It's not. It, you don't get excited about it, right? Right. right. That's exactly right. But it's. But if you're looking for consistency and quality, yeah. that's oh my what God. I'm looking for. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm looking for. For sure. I, I think Absolutely. you should stick with the pixels. You're also then getting a pure Android experience. Well, I know, which is. Good. But isn't there a new Duo coming? Uh, whew, so I, I would stick with the Pixel. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, Microsoft takes three times minimum to get the hardware right. We're only up to number okay, two. Okay, wait for the next one then. Yeah, next, next one. Mm. Mm-hmm. Trio, mm. Surface Trio. The Trio. Mm. <laughs> Surface Trio. Oh, God. <laughs> That's what we need. It opens up like some kind of ancient manuscript. Exactly. Like you unfold. You know, the, the 1600s, they got it right. So we're going back to that. <laughs> it's interesting because because the pixel is uninteresting like doesn't isn't there is less uh impetus to buy the new one when it comes out it's like i've right. i'm never stuck with the old no, you don't like the, rush right, to it right, right? well that was so the, the one you're fun. holding was the last one they had that actually had like high-end hardware in it um, yeah was it yeah. yeah and i this is a pixel 4 xl and so i have no I, desire I think to mistake, buy a new one it's like if they had done fun. If that thing had shipped with a an ultra wide instead of a telephoto, I probably would have stuck with it as well. If I had to choose between those lenses, right? But I would prefer to have all three. Yes, I agree. Uh, the ultra wide is very I'm, useful. Yeah. yeah, I'm very, very, very much hoping some Pixel this year has all three lenses, and that and at that point, I would just say, okay, I, they're I kind of due for a refresh. They've they've really um, been kind of at a plateaued on the camera over the last, mm-hmm. I think, two or three oh, yeah. generations. Yep, for sure. It's still a pretty it's, good It's good, camera. though. It's still oh, good. Because it's, it's one of the best. But there's, yeah. right. but it's starting to get to where Samsung and Apple are, you know, kind of getting better and better. And they're, mm-hmm. uh, you know, not not improving. So I feel like yeah. this would be the year that, that yeah. the Pixel phone would say, so. let's do, you okay. know, let's really pay attention to the then. camera module. They lost yeah. the guy uh, who was their camera guru. Who oh, right. is at Adobe now? And Adobe. Uh, Mark, uh, yeah. what's that guy's name? Mark something. Um, he and, and I don't know if you saw this, but Adobe just came up with a feature. This is not in the mobile app he's probably working on, but in Photoshop, came up with like a pixel doubling yeah. technology that's it's supposed really to be able cool. to take older, lower. It's supposed yeah. to be amazing. He may have worked uh, on that because that's kind of yeah. his his whole area is computational. Yeah, computer, yeah, exactly. photography. So it could have been him worked on that. Uh, and what Adobe does have is a camera in their mobile app apps, right? Right, and, and that's so, why when I saw that, I thought, man, if they could bring that to the Adobe app, the, whatever they call it, the Photoshop camera app, yeah. you know, <laughs> that would I would pay for something like All that. Right. All right, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. Then I'm gonna. It's a long unless, wait. It's nine unless months. Unless you say 
I know. You know, my phone still works. It's just starting a few little well, quirks now. But here's what's going to happen. So over the summer, certainly you will start a five hearing rumors. A, right? Well, there'll be rumors about whatever the six is. Right? Yeah. Right. And whether you know, and we'll we can kind of assess it and and figure That's out true. if they're going to do anything true. dramatic. Yeah, you yeah. really want to know what the camera is going to do. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I do. That's there's what not, I care about. Yeah, there's not much reason to improve anything else, to be honest. No. I, want the dis- I like the big display also. I don't want a small display. I like the big size. Yeah, yeah that's actually one thing I kind of miss. Uh, the, right? the 4A 5G is kind of the minimum size I yeah. think for me. Um, it's not perfect for sure. Uh, did you really want to talk about Vivaldi or am I... Just real quick, okay. again, just to be fair to everybody, <laughs> okay. um, uh, they just released a new version of their browser uh, on desktop, which has dramatic uh, performance oh. gains. And on Apple is a native M1 version now as well. So oh, nice. And they're based um, on this Chromium, is, right? Yep. And their big thing is customization. They have crazy customization options, if that's your thing. And you kind of want the compatibility of Chromium, but you really want to go nuts on the UI. Um Vivaldi is what you're looking for. So. Nice. Yeah, okay, just to be fair to those okay. guys. Let's do a little Xbox thing. Yeah. So I had a huge thing about Discord, but we already talked about that. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what do we got here? So the first yeah, the first one, this is crazy, but Microsoft, they, they actually did this, I think, last August, and no one really noticed. But they're not using the term Xbox Live anymore. Um, for the network, right? There's still something called Xbox Live Gold, which is the paid subscription service. Um, but from a network perspective, like Xbox Live used to refer to the name of the network, but now it's just Xbox Network, small n, because it's like the network, you know, Xbox's network. And I have no idea why they did this. I don't think this confused anybody, but Microsoft thinks it does. So they're changing the name. I don't know. Um, what else we got here? Uh, we, this, I think dates back to that last ignite. We had caught wind of some, uh, gaming windows and security events that were coming up. The gaming event was, uh, set for March. I believe this is it, I guess. Uh, it's not super dramatic, but it's a partnership with Twitch to do a independent game showcase uh, oh, on March cool. 26th. I like yeah. indie games. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. So that's neat. Um, and that's, what did I say? It's Friday, Friday, Friday. Actually, that's this week. Sorry, that's Friday. That. Yeah. So you think that's the gaming event, the thing on the We're 26th. running out of days. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, I sort of I thought it was going to be bigger than this, and maybe it, yeah. maybe there is another one coming. Yeah. Hmm. This is kind of squeaking in at the end of the month, so. Right. Hmm. It is 100 new games. I mean, that's big. I don't know. A lot of them will be on... Uh, Xbox Game Pass. This seems like a lot of ID at Xbox mm-hmm. games end up there. So Stalker mm-hmm. Two, Second Extinction, The Accent, The Wild yep. at Heart, Void Train, XO One. Huh. Don't know any of those, but that's because yeah, the exactly. Games. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, one of the uh, the first one you said, uh, uh, Stalker. Stalker is yeah, is somewhat famous. Anyway, whatever. That's good. Um, and then for people who are waiting for the Xbox wireless head- headset, that is actually now available. Remember, this is the $99 over-the-air headset. Works um, great with works, Discord. It works <laughs> great, yeah. So I have not reviewed this. I'm probably not going to. I don't like those big headphone things on my ears, but um, it's it's supposed to be good. I, in, in The way that Brad put it was just that it's uh, if you're used to high-quality gaming headsets, it's not as good as those. But if you're looking for that kind of console style simplicity, and it's nice that you can sync with two or um, uh, have it paired with two different devices at once, right? So you can do that thing where you're, you're on your phone and on the Xbox at the same time, or whatever the two devices you choose. Certainly, nice. the price is right. It's probably a good deal for ninety nine dollars. And then Nvidia is raising, actually, they're doubling the price of, uh, of GeForce now, which sounds horrible, but actually. Um, GeForce 9 has only been $4.99 per month so far, so it's going up to $9.99. Oh, if you're already cancel. in. <laughs> oh, you're, well, no, if you're in. If you're already in, yeah. they're going to keep the price. Oh, yeah, good. Keep the $4.99. Because 5 bucks is a no-brainer. 10 bucks. I know, it's crazy. Yeah, it's a little yeah, know, yeah. more than I want to spend. That's two games yep. a month, a year. Yeah. 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 That's so interesting. We'll that Although they're it's a good things. streaming have... service. It works really well, especially on the, um, yeah. on the Shield, the NVIDIA Shield. I guess they have ray traced. Uh, ray tracing yeah. is available through yeah. this thing, which is kind yeah, of amazing. It's wild, so wild, yeah. That's neat. Okay, 
Yeah. And that's your Xbox Entertainment News. Got. <laughs> Let's uh, take a teeny, teeny time out, and then uh, we will come back with the back of the book, Paul's Tips, Mary Jo's Beer, you know, the things you're really waiting for. <laughs> the things you really want. First, a word about sour milk. <laughs> What? Huh? what? <laughs> a new sponsor. I want to welcome to the show, uh, Sour Milk. No. But did you know that like uh, that carton of milk in your fridge, uh, data, customer data to be specific, goes bad fast. About 30% goes bad every year because people move, phone numbers change, emails change. It's just what happens. It, there's an attrition rate. Melissa is here to make sure your customer data is not only uh, current but fully accurate. Because you don't want to waste money trying to reach out to customers who are no longer at this address. Melissa's tools, have been, they've been doing this for a long time. They've been used by businesses for over 35 years to maintain fresh, ah, fresh data. 10,000 businesses trust Melissa, the address experts. So Melissa's kind of funny because it, it can, you can use it in a variety of ways. So uh, you can uh, have it... Uh, on-prem, of course, just, you know, run it locally. Uh, most people, I think, probably use it either as a web service or use the Melissa API. That's very popular because then you can incorporate it into your customer service software, for instance, or your website, so that when data is entered, it's entered accurately uh, without error. And, you know, customers make mistakes. They transpose digits and phone numbers. Customer service reps, same thing. In fact, if you've ever started typing it in and it fills it out automatically, that's often that's Melissa and it does it accurately too. It's really amazing. They also have an, uh, you know, uh, kind of old fashioned, old school FTP, secure FTP. So you can upload a list, uh, a contact list or whatever, download a clean version, uh, software as a service as well. So you choose the version that works best for you. You can verify addresses, emails, phone numbers and names. And it's fast, so that's why you could do it with the API in real time. It's really pretty amazing. Their global address verification service works for over 240 countries and territories right at the point of entry. They also dedupe. That's important, too. Um, deduplication means you eliminate clutter, you eliminate duplicates, you save time and money, you don't send out multiple catalogs to the same address, things like that. Melissa is, of course totally careful with your data. They undergo independent security audits on a regular basis, continually basically, to reinforce their commitment to data security, privacy, and of course, because they know you've got compliance requirements. So do they. SOC2, HIPAA, GDPR compliant. You don't have to worry about that. Melissa is supporting communities right now the, and qualifying essential workers during our COVID crisis. Your organization may well qualify for six months of Melissa free. Bottom line, don't put up with sour customer data. <laughs> Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records clean free. Melissa.com slash twit, M-E-L-I-S-S-A. -S Fresh data is easy, easy as one, two, three at Melissa.com slash twit. I think you'll like it. They're really the king of the hill in this, the address experts. Now, little Paulie's got our tip of the week. Thank you for not saying, speaking of sour, here's Speaking Paul. of sour, Paul <laughs> Verratt. <laughs> uh, so the tip of the week is if you are a Microsoft 365 subscriber in first release, which I think is commercial customers only, right? Is that, the, is that what that is? I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's commercial customers. But mm. uh, Microsoft has implemented the ability to convert a Word document in Word Online or Word for the Web, I guess, to a PowerPoint presentation, right? There's been a lot of um, a lot of confusion about this feature, right? In other words, people think you're not going to write a normal document and then say, convert this into a great slideshow, right? Um, what you're doing is creating a simple document that has headers, headings, heading styles, and it will use those headings to determine where the new slides start and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of people, people write in outlines, especially if you're writing a talk or yeah. a presentation. Yeah. And it just natural to take an outline right into PowerPoint. Yeah, exactly. So this is the, an automated way to do that. Right now it's text only too. So, it, you know, don't add pictures to it and expect them to pull over. Although I think that's coming. It's also English only at this point, but 
It's also only on the web at this point. But again, this is the type of thing that's going to expand out. And so this is the, I, I think they had, I think we knew this was coming, but this is the first time we've seen it implemented and uh, it, it needs to be in the web version of the, of these products. So that's kind of a cool feature, I think. And then the app pick of the week, this was based on the fact that Microsoft released a new version of Microsoft Edge in the dev channel that has two major new features that I think are actually kind of cool. Um, the first one is color themes, right? There's already a theme section in the Edge web store where you can get like Halo themes and things like this. But this is more akin to what you see, I think, already in um, Chrome. Although actually, these are probably in the Chrome web store too, but you have the ability to change just the color theme of the browser, which I think is kind of nice. Um, and then perhaps even more important, uh, the ability to use your Microsoft account in Edge for Linux. And that means you sign in to your Microsoft account and it syncs everything, right? So your extensions, your passwords, your uh, form fill data, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is the first step. Well, not the first step, but this is a major step, I think, in, in making the Linux version of the browser um, you know, as, as fully functional as we see it on Mac and Windows. And if you're looking for AAD style, like, you know, commercial Microsoft account, uh, sign in and sync, that is coming in the future as well. So the pick, such as it is, is the uh, the dev version of Microsoft Edge, which I've just switched to literally so I can experiment with these features. And if you're familiar with the, that's going to change, but the way that Edge works today is we have a Canary version, which is updated every day, which is probably too aggressive for most people. And then we have dev is the next step up every six weeks today, although, yes, that's changing. Uh, beta is the step after that, and then we go to stable. So I've actually been using stable since probably there was a stable. But now that we're, you know, we're starting to see like a kind of some interesting new features show up. I've actually just switched over to using uh, Microsoft Edge Dev today because um, I want to start looking at these features uh, a little before they're fully baked or whatever. So you can check nice. that out if you'd like. Is it pretty stable? Yeah, I think yeah. it is. Although, you know, that can vary, of course. Yeah. Uh, and there's no reason not to have multiple versions of Edge or multiple oh, browsers oh, installed. Oh, perfect. So, so you can have them both. Yeah, if you have, if you have an issue, you can nice. always switch over. Well, Sirachi has shown up. That means it's time for Mary Jo Foley <laughs> yes. and her and her. Sirachi really <laughs> knows, you've, you've doesn't talked, she? You've talked doesn't to he? someone who is not Sirachi enough. Yeah. He just knows <laughs> that, oh, you must be at the back of the book, so it's time for me. He does. It's like when it's close to 4 o'clock, he's like, okay, okay. the show must be almost show over. show must be over. Boy, it's, <laughs> cats are kind of amazing. They are. Enterprise pick of the week. Right. So when we were talking about Microsoft reopening the campus, um, that was one of two big announcements they made this week. The other one was they published something they're calling the Work Trend Index. Um, and this is a year-long study that they've done with tens of thousands of people about how the pandemic has affected work um, for companies of all sizes. So most of this is stuff that you're kind of like, yeah, we're not that surprised. You know, like hybrid work is here to stay. No kidding, right? But there are a few things in this workplace index that I thought were very interesting and kind of telling. Um, one of them was they acknowledge that leaders are really out of touch largely with their companies. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was very bold of them to publish that and that people Clearly who are, not published by the Microsoft leadership. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. They're like, right. so most business leaders are faring a lot better than the everyday employees and they're kind of out of touch with what people well, that's true. are experiencing. I, that's true. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so they said as a result, 40, look, listen to this number, 41% of the global workforce is considering leaving their current employer within the next year. Wow. That's huge. Right. Wow. And if so you're that, Generation so, Z, even higher, 54% are considering leaving. I, I got to say, though, where are you going to go? Some other leader Thank that's you. out of touch, right? I know. Two, I two know. words, folks. Travel vlogger. <laughs> <laughs> Influencer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that one number, though, like stuck with me because, you know, some of this is people who can relocate now because – their companies aren't requiring them to come in in person. And they're like, oh, so I can go live in Hawaii. I can live wherever I want, right? <laughs> but I do think uh, but, this this point uh, that high productivity masks an exhausted workforce is probably yes. a good thing for management to hear. It is. Yeah. You know, because they were everybody's talking about, look at how many more, you know, teams meetings we're having this year. But is that always a good number? Like, right. do you want to see we're having right. double the number of teams meetings? We well, don't want to see that, right? Because think about how exhausted you are doing video all day, all the time. And 
you know, it's, it's right. a lot to ask of people, right? <laughs> wow. Yep. Yeah. I know. So they, if you, any, and this is a report that anybody can view, it's free. So if you go to, if you just look for Microsoft Work Lab, all one word, Work Lab, and there you can find all kinds of research they've done and then look for Work Trend Index if you want to look at this. And there's, there are a lot of kind of interesting and thought provoking bits in here, I thought, more, more than I expected anyway. We all need a vacation. Yes, we do. <laughs> I think that might be sort of the source of some of this is that we've noticed this with yeah. our employees. They don't, they kind of don't want to take time off when there's nowhere to go. So right. there's You're been like, a whole, where are you going to go? Home. Right. <laughs> so there's been a whole year of people not really taking vacations. And I think that may yeah. be some of the source of this. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, the managers can go to their yachts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's what we take a helicopter to the yeah. uh, to the yacht and then yeah. uh, that's a you know <laughs> different experience right mm-hmm. um you have another kind of a little extra here the uh, well, well first i have the code name pick oh sorry oh. didn't see that code name yep. yeah this is a kind of a fun code name project naria is huh. the code name not narnia Which, naria <laughs> no no but uh comes from ring of fire from lord of the rings Oh, really? Oh. They say. Was this one like one of the elven rings or something? Is that what that is? Uh, no. It's the ring of fire, which is known to resist the weariness of time. Burn, 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 that burning ring of fire. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I know a lot about Tolkien and I have no I idea. Don't, that doesn't, about doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you, this is from Mark Rusinovich. Now I'm going to so look gonna, this up. Like, no, no, no. It's one I'm of the rings. Say, yeah. It, it's, it's, so it's, is? it is. Okay. It's one of the yeah. elven rings. Guys, that's what I yeah. said. That's, it's the ring of fire. <laughs> One of the three rings of power made originally for the elves. Uh, yes. it's the, it has the power to inspire others to resist tyranny, domination, yeah. and despair. All right, so which of the elves so was wearing lie. it, though? That's what they said. Which of the elves? Which, who was it? Uh, who it? Created by Sela Brimlor in the Second mm-hmm. Age, along with Nania and Vilya, after Sauron disguised as the mysterious Anatar and left Eregion. Naria was free of his influence, having been crafted only by Celebrimbor himself, and later hidden from Anatar's grasp. <laughs> oh, the Second Age, am I right? Oh, uh, <laughs> upon the arrival of Gandalf in Middle Earth, in the Third Age, Sirdan, knowing Gandalf's true nature and duty, gave him Naria to aid him oh. in his labors. None okay. save Elrond, Galadriel, and Serdan knew that Gandalf bore it through the third yeah, I guess, age. Cause, right, cause that's why I asked, because I know they, those two were the other two that had the other two. Right? Yeah. All right, um, guys. This is nice. We're having a little reminiscence on the other <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for the fandom wiki. In the, oh, man. In the Hobbit Extended Edition, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> an additional scene, you, it wasn't in the released movie, but in the extended edition includes Gandalf being questioned about Narya at Dol Guldur. Narya itself is invisible, but reveals itself on Gandalf's hand when questioned. So he's wearing it. It's Gandalf's yeah. ring. There you go. That's a good ring. That's the ring you want. Okay. Do you Rick want to know why they call your questions? this Yeah, why, <laughs> why are they using it as a code name? <laughs> so Narya yeah. is... It's code name for a piece of infrastructure in Azure that's all about end-to-end prediction and mitigation, right? So it's meant to predict failures and measure the impact of mitigations in advance so that Microsoft can kind of intelligently correct problems. So, you know, we're always talking about outages in Azure and problems with authentication and such, but they are working on different kind of futuristic, more futuristic pieces of the Azure infrastructure that are supposed to fix things. So if Naria has to do with resisting the weariness of time, you can see why they might have called this Project Naria. You think every time it fixes a problem, it says, you shall not pass. (laughs) I think so. I think there's some secret things that come out of the mouth of the Azure servers. It's the only way you're going to beat a Balrog in the uh, data center. (laughs) Wow. It's a it's ruby set in a gold band. It's a beautiful <laughs> ring, actually. Uh, so if you if you think that's interesting and this is your kind of stuff, 
Apparently we this, do. This Azure infrastructure <laughs> stuff is your jam. Yeah. You want to oh, go man. find the Mark Rusinovich video from Ignite oh, because neat. he does this really deep talk about inside the Azure data center architecture. And anybody can go look at this. It's free. Um, and he talks about all these kinds of futuristic pieces that they're building into Azure um, to try to improve resiliency. Oh, cool. And uh, Does he call basically it he talks precious? about all like... Yeah, he talks about all these crazy things, all the super gigantic servers and all the crazy things they could do with them now and where they're thinking about going. So it's it's a fun video for people who care about Azure infrastructure. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Now for the extra. Oh, that was it. That was the uh, the. That video. was the extra that piece. That was the extra. Yep. Yep. Now for the, yep. the afterglow. I think yes. we should we should call this segment every week the afterglow. afterglow. The afterglow. We should. Yes. We should. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right. So that's the name of my beer pick today is Afterglow. Um it's from Great Notion Brewing, which is in Portland, Oregon. And um up till now I had had very little of this because I I only could get it when I was on the West Coast, but they're starting to distribute during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, to lots of other places. And so I get to try this. It's a typical, I shouldn't say typical. It's an excellent example of the West Coast IPA style. Huh. So it's it's um, like a little piney, a little resiny, but you get all the true clean hop piney? flavor. So like, it, like gin piney. kind of? <laughs> like, like, a pie, like if you were gnawing on a pine needle, that kind yeah. of taste. Yep. Which is an IPA thing. You know, some people like that. Not gnawing on pine trees. They just like that flavor. Um, <laughs> you like gnawing on a pine tree. You're going to love IPAs. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of. Um, but it's it's really clean and really fresh. And it's I'm so excited they're starting to distribute because they make all styles of beers. They make sours and stouts and IPAs. They're especially known for their IPAs. And to get them out on the East Coast is awesome. And look at the can. you got to show the picture of the can because it's wild their looking. can artwork is fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. You no, know, just in time for Easter, you get the bunny doing the meditation. Kind of a crazy food. looking bunny. <laughs> yeah. I like it. yeah. 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 So great new great notion. If you ever see anything from them, excellent beer choices um and fun that we're getting it out here now on the East Coast. Nice. Yeah. Nice. A nice IPA. I didn't realize it was you know, a different. I haven't done in, an IPA for a while. It's summer. Yeah, it's a New summer. England IPA, New England IPAs, and West Coast IPAs are very different beers. Really? Because of course, uh, Lagunitas, our local brewery across the street here, is uh, known for its IPAs. I yeah, didn't realize there was Coast a distinction. Style. What is the East Coast yep. style? Is it more East Coast style? Are typically more hazy gangster. and juice. <laughs> they taste more like juice. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, ours like, are not like, juicy. They're piney. No, yours are more like piney dank, <laughs> all like the typical things people think of when they think of an IPA. Piney dank. Yeah. Yeah. That's the name. That's, that's <laughs> I like both. I yeah. like both styles. Um, yeah. They're just different. <laughs> <laughs> that's Mary Jo Foley. She's different too. You'll find her at allaboutmicrosoft.com or CDNet <laughs> blog. Uh, is she, Do you ever share your untapped handle? Is that? Yes, that, I do. What, what uh, is that? MJ Foley on Untapped. Easy to find. Um, yeah, I have a little. Cat um, you'll be icon. depressed when you look at it because I'll just tell you now, <laughs> you're never catching up. <laughs> <laughs> just so, just put that idea out of your head. <laughs> oh, I can't wait till we get out and drink beer again. That would be fun. We used to Henry and I used to go to Lagunitas every week for lunch out in their wow. beer garden. It was really, yeah, it's I really so enjoyed cool that. There, it's yeah. such a beautiful. You will do that there. again someday, someday. Yep. Uh, Paul Thorat, you'll find him at Thorat.com. His uh, field guide to Windows 10 is at leanpub.com. Together, they are the dynamic duo of Windows journalism, Microsoft journalism. And we are very grateful that they join us every week here on uh, Wednesdays around 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. Watch us do it live at twit.tv slash live. There's audio or video, your choice. You can listen or watch. If you're watching live or listening live, chat live, get all three senses engaged at irc.twit.tv. Although now I'm thinking maybe we should have a Discord. I know, Discord. I was just going to say. Got to get a do Discord. Discord. Yeah. We're th you know, <laughs> we, we got some plans. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. We got some We got some ideas. We got some ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also offer, of course, on-demand versions of everything uh, at our website, twit.tv. For this show, it's twit.tv slash dub dub. 
Uh, there's a YouTube channel dedicated to it. Easiest way to find any of our YouTube channels is go to the main YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit. There's links there to all the other channels. You can also, of course, and it's probably the best thing to do, subscribe. If you subscribe, subscribe and rate in your favorite podcast application. Five stars, always appreciated. If you want to leave some pros, you can do that too. Um, Pocket Cast, uh, Outcast, Overcast, Undercast. Google Podcasts. Google Podcasts, <laughs> Apple Podcasts. We're everywhere. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Mary Jo. Have a great week. Stay safe. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast episode. If you would like to check out more about tech news, then you should check out Tech News Weekly with me, Micah Sargent, my co-host, Jason Howell, where we interview the people making and breaking the tech news every week.